the document that's been <coughs> used, uh, off do that so uh, before we get started we did have uh, a uh, consent agenda yep so we'll move to approve the consent agenda which includes the minutes from December 11th and 18th Second. Second. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Four zero. Is that the end of the evening? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Darty. Thank you, uh, Mr. Robinson. As as uh, you just mentioned, uh, we we did get some questions after the meeting last week uh, by some members um, of the audience about. The different parts of the budget book and the munis budget so we thought we would take a couple of minutes and have mrs dowd um, talk a little bit about the contents of our budget book we did do some restructuring this year to the budget book and also the munit budget and munit munis budget and how how that is structured um, both of those documents were distributed the other night and i believe we do have copies available this evening as well great thank you We'll keep this relatively high level, but we did want to quickly walk through the two documents that everybody received as well as they should all now. I believe they were posted on Monday evening. The first one is the budget book. That is what we are walking through as we meet this week. That actually is the same as the munis budget. What we have done in the budget book is we roll it up to higher level, level categories to make it easier to walk through as well as explain all of the various categories and reasons for different changes between the categories the book also breaks it down between the five different cost centers in a summarized fashion by the five different categories that we've been talking about and we also have details of each cost center within the budget book one of the items we have done based upon a lot of the feedback we received um, from the budget liaisons as well as from public comment last year which we, we do appreciate we have reorganized the book such that all of the financial information is right at the beginning of the book whereas in the past we used to have a lot more town information a lot of the desi information up front and then we would go into the financial section so in order to make it easier for people we've reorganized it to pull all of the financial information up front in the first section and then the historical town information as well as a lot of the Department of Education information, the per pupil information from DESE, that is in the appendices in the back. So it does have all of the same information, it's just reorganized to make it a little bit more user friendly and you can get to the financial information right up front. The other item we did want to briefly mention is the MUNIS budget. So for anyone who's an accounting geek like I am, that is really what I would consider the general ledger of the school district. So that is virtually every line item that makes up the detailed budget. It is actually the exact same information as it in the budget book. It's just at a much more granular level. And the information that is in the Munis printout is the fiscal 15, 16, and 17 actuals. The 2018 budget as adopted by town meeting last year the only changes you will see in the budget is if we have cost center budget transfers approved by school committee those get reflected in that column we did want to point out that that FY 18 budget column stays the same it does not get updated to reflect actual activity it is the budget as approved any updates or changes or differences between the budget to actual are what we present to school committee when we do our quarterly projection updates we did get a couple of questions as to why that column doesn't necessarily reflect actual it's because that is the budget and that cannot change unless we receive approval to do so and then the what's called projection level one that is what we are presenting as the fiscal 19 budget we also wanted to just briefly mention as we have through this what we've included in the budget for all of the various salary line items are average increases as discussed and approved through school committee we received guidance as to what the average increase should be that we use to build the budget that has been reflected in here 
the final determination of any non-represented salary adjustments um, those are determined much later in the process so that would be through the superintendent depending on actual performance economic conditions and that typically happens early summer and then we do have that amount of money available that's in here that we would then distribute we do put it in the various line items um, but it does not necessarily indicate exactly where that will be that's determined later in the year the only two salaries that are not part of that process would be the superintendent and director of finance those salaries are determined by the school committee so they determine those and tell us what those amounts would be we also wanted to let people know that included within the non-represented salary line so a lot of the administration we do have various stipends to use a consistent word that could be if we have new principals new team chairs new members of administration we do pay mentor stipends we don't necessarily know today who those people will be and who will actually receive those so we do budget those within various administrative salary line items so we know we have them captured for next year and then once we know who those would be we we set up the appropriate people to pay them out so those are within the various salary line items as well so we just wanted to we did receive a few questions as to how it was pulled together and what was represented in those line items so we wanted to provide a little clarification on that thank you Gail. so I'd like to just further add to that uh, the you know the part of the reason for including the uh, munis uh, budget in the, in the back of the request that come a few years ago and it it does uh, bring a, a further level of transparency as to what's uh, in the the budget book in that it will uh, actually break down salary positions sometimes by you know individual or, or position uh, and you know I have to say that the you know the school committee takes its job very seriously uh, when it comes to realizing that we need to be uh, competitive uh, to retain and attract the best possible staff we can get and we do that uh, with our rep we try to do that with our representative uh, employees you know I i.e. the teachers and, and, and paraeducators and custodians and nurses and all of those uh, different unions and similarly we feel that way about non-represented uh, staff uh, uh, that being uh, primarily uh, the central office staff and even more even more so in uh, these in these times we we deal with seems like every year uh, we we feel we need to retain and attract the uh, best possible staff that we can get uh, and and when we make these adjustments it's because uh, we, we recognize what's out there and what we have and what those people could do at other places so uh, we did consciously make those decisions and we're very comfortable with them and and are willing to discuss and defend those in in public so thank you for taking the time for that is there any questions on the board unless you feel like okay so I'm going, to, I'm going to focus on the regular day cost center, <coughs> excuse me, and then uh, Mrs. Wilson is going to uh, present the special education budget. So this evening I'm going to do a lot more scanning than I did, did the other day. So before I begin, uh, we've had a couple of changes with the uh, calendar. Um, we, and this is to, to actually conform to the, the town bylaws. Uh, we, when we originally set up the calendar, we were uh, trying to create a more accelerated calendar because we knew that the information for the final budget needed to get to the town manager in a, in a timely manner so that he could get it to the finance committee quicker um, so that the community would have the information um, quicker prior to a potential uh, ballot question in early April. So 
but we also um, looked at the bylaws uh, recently and realized that there were a couple areas that we needed to tweak on our calendar in order to stay within the guidelines of the, the town bylaws. So tonight, we're going to do regular day special education. Tomorrow evening will be our first of two public hearings. Um, and then we will be presenting the restructured budget, uh, which is the budget that I'm recommending, our team is recommending to the school committee um, for consideration to move forward to the, to the board of selectmen. And then on the 18th, next Thursday, there will be a school committee discussion. Uh, there will be questions that we'll be presenting the answers to that have come up. Um, all of that will be done on the 18th. On the 22nd will be the second of two public hearings. Uh, give to the community another opportunity to, to uh, give input on the budget. And then uh, if time permits, the school committee will vote that evening. If not, we have posted another meeting for the 23rd. That would be if necessary. Um, obviously, we would rather have it done on the 22nd so we can get the budget quicker to the town manager. Um, but that, that is the updated calendar. The, the change tonight is that there's a second public hearing that will be on the 22nd. So I'm going to present the regular day cost center. Um, so this is 50, excuse me, 58.1 percent of the total budget. These are all of the areas that would be in the regular that are in the regular day cost center. Essentially, anything that's not special education related that's connected um, to the classroom um, is in the regular day cost center. So it includes your building administration, secretaries, your teachers, your regular education parent educators, and regular education. Tutors, um, ELL, school psychologists, reading specialists, guidance counselors, any curriculum material, stipends that are connected to um, general classroom teachers, um, substitutes, um, the mandatory bus transportation that, that we offer students, um, homeless transportation, and any instructional materials and supplies, instructional technology or equipment. So anything that's related to the classroom that's not special education related is in this cost center, which is why it is the largest cost center. What you see here is actually a decrease of 0.5% to this cost center. The primary driver for that is the fact that we have had to make reductions of uh, a total of 13 FTE positions in, um, in, this, in this cost center for next year. Those personnel reductions include four elementary classroom teachers, seven middle school teachers, and two regular education tutors. In addition to um, deal with enrollment changes that are happening, we already know that we have at least 300 students that will be in kindergarten next year that have signed up already between full day and half day. Um, that is an increase over the last two years of 20 to 30 students, which we anticipate that that number will get higher because our census is showing that there are still several students out there. So we are, uh, in this budget, adding a kindergarten teacher and two kindergarten parent educators uh, for our kindergarten students. There are also some restructured positions, which we talked about on Monday evening. Uh, the literacy coach position that we're currently using for training for our elementary for math and literacy. Uh, it is a position we could not fill this summer um, when the vacancy occurred. Um, we are. We are restructuring that for the data coach position, uh, which is a grant funded position. That grant is going to be expiring in, the, oh, in, the, in about over a year. And then also, and we talked about this the other night, uh, the high school secretary position uh, and the salary difference from the data coach, along with expenses in the administration cost center. So that funding is going to the administration cost center for the restoration of the school business assistant. So the major changes in this cost center, um, as Mrs. Dowd said earlier, includes all of the salary and uh, benefit obligations for um, representative and non-representative employees uh, that would be associated with this cost center, all of the staffing that I mentioned earlier. Um, and we are ending, we're at the end of a uh, one-year contract, we will begin negotiations shortly uh, with all five collective bargaining units. We are also restoring funding to the FY17 levels for the following areas. Um, District-wide technology funds, we're uh, restoring $50,000 to go back up to $100,000. Uh, 
uh, the per pupil building expenditures, which I am going to have uh, one of our principals talk about that this evening. Um, that's going to be, uh, we're bringing that back up to, uh, to uh, really about 685000 so 100000 more, and then restoring to historic levels our substitute teachers. These are all results of the one-time expense cuts that we made in order to preserve um, the seven middle school teacher positions last year towards the end of the budget process. In addition to that, there was $100,000 um, one time amount that came from free cash to help fund those positions as well. And that was not built on the base for this year. We also, in this budget, had to add a second bus. That second bus we actually had to implement this year. It was not originally in the FY18 budget, but, we, but as enrollment increased with bus transportation, um, for mandatory transportation and students that are along that route, we realized we needed to restore the second bus back in 18, so we're keeping it in the 19 budget. And then, uh, just as an aside, the 19 budget does not include funding for the third year of the science curriculum implementation. We are going to address that, though, in the uh, reconstruction budget that you'll see tomorrow. <coughs> so I want to briefly talk about the impact of the personnel reductions. I'm also going to have the middle school um, our middle school principals come up and talk a little bit about in detail about the middle school piece. So the four FTE elementary classroom teachers, this will be in grades three through five. Um, it will be, where the reductions occur will be based on class size. Um, and that's something that we're going to monitor through, throughout the projected enrollment for next year and then make a decision um, in the spring as to where that would be if, if we do not receive additional funding. Uh, the class sizes would go up to as high as 27 in those classes in those affected schools. <coughs> in terms of the middle school piece, uh, I'm actually going to have um, Sarah Marchand and uh, Michelle Shanklin, the, the two principals of the middle school, talk more about those uh, reductions. Thank you, Joan. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Marchant. I'm the principal of Coolidge, and my fifth year there. And we have had the pleasure in my years there as a science teacher at Coolidge prior to becoming principal of having a very strong middle school model. Um, we're really proud of what we're able to provide for our students. And what we're able to provide is not only core curriculum classes that we're really proud of, but a lot of enrichment opportunities, social emotional support, intervention, advisory, um, many different things that we feel are critical to adolescent development. And as we look at this proposed balanced budget, um, I know we agree with Dr. Doherty in that we don't feel like it's an ideal budget for what we want to provide for our students, and I know we share those feelings with all of you. Um, so what, it, what this proposed budget reduction is at the middle level is the elimination basically of one <coughs> Um, subject per grade level is a way to think about it, um, or one class per day. And that would be the sixth grade English language arts, which currently has two blocks a day. Um, so that, because we really feel that literacy development is so important in the transition from fifth to sixth, that was a way we really wanted to support kids. And seventh and eighth grade introduction would be in foreign language, which we currently both schools offer Spanish and French. So we would be eliminating foreign language um, in both seventh and eighth grade. And this is unfortunate, obviously, in that not only are we taking away what we feel is core curriculum for our students, but we feel like it's eroding what we feel, just the beginning of eroding what we feel like is a really strong middle school model um, that has been in place for a long time. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the impact it will have, not just on foreign language and ELA, but on some other elements of our curriculum. So. I'll move it over to Ricky. Hi, I'm Ricky I'm the principal at Parker. Um, this is my second year there. And as Sarah said, we have been able to offer such robust curriculum to our students um, with the foreign language, with the additional English language arts at sixth grade, which has a big impact on their ability to do higher level thinking, <coughs> higher level writing skills, reading skills in seventh and eighth grade as a result of that. 
also um, in sixth grade coming in, the teachers are able to have focus on a smaller number of students, the model that we have right now. That will no longer be the case. Um, so targeting areas of students that need to be worked on, pushing students to move ahead when it's time for them to move ahead, those, that's going to be a lot more difficult next year. So the obvious part um, that we're talking about are the, the core content areas that are going to be affected. Um, the less obvious parts, um, in addition to the foreign language, foreign language acquisition, we know there are huge benefits to that, and that not only affects them, um, you know, as middle schoolers, but helps them become <coughs> just the acquisition of a language alone, the grammar studies that they do, um, putting sentences together, all of that is connected to content areas in a way that I think that we really can't even, um, you know, begin to explain. But um, so in addition to the content areas, our programming is definitely going to have to change. Um, we have to build new schedules, obviously. Students attend four and six classes a day instead of seven as already stated, um, and with a new schedule and less personnel, it will have the impact on, um, one thing that will have it'll impact is special education. So although we do need to continue providing special education services as required by law, it is going to um, limit the places that we can pull students from to get those services. So some of the things that students really like to do, such as art and music and things like that, we're really, really going to um, have to make some choices about what those things are that those students can't participate in, which is very unfortunate. Um, students are will also have to make hard choices between, um, you know, the music, like our students get a lot of music lessons. We have a really great, excellent music program in our schools. Some students are going to have to make choices about what they're going to participate in um, against, music, you know, additional music lessons like they have now. Um, there's also going to be fewer built-in opportunities for teachers to provide intervention support um, and extension. And in addition to that, there's less opportunities, there's going to be less opportunities for social emotional support with fewer adults in the building. Those are fewer people that kids can connect with. Um, we're very fortunate to have small sizes in our advisory programs, uh, our advisory um, this year. Those numbers will have to get, will get larger. If we continue with our advisory program with less teachers. So the impacts really do our school wide. They go beyond the positions that the, the positions that we are talking about. Um, and Ricky's brought to light a lot of good and direct student impacts. <coughs> um, and certainly by trying to expand the discussion, we're not trying to discount the importance of what we feel like those core subjects are and losing those are. Um, our message here is really to help the community understand how it permeates the entire middle school schedule. Um, and on the teacher side, their schedules will look different in a couple different ways. One, we have such strong planning time right now at the middle school where teachers meet every day to collaborate, to talk about the students. They're in interdisciplinary teams and they share students and they get to know students really, really well. Those interdisciplinary teams will stay in place. So what will change is we won't be able to provide common planning time every day for the teachers. So in those times that they're collaborating or setting up parent meetings um, or working out student challenges, that won't be as frequent, which is unfortunate. Um, and we will actually also have to restructure some of the duties of some of our teachers. A couple of examples are our technology integration specialists who currently have small teaching loads and their main goal is both to maintain technology as far as it connects with curriculum but to also help teachers develop their technology skills and to bring more technology into the classroom so they're often collaborating and working with teachers. Likewise, our librarians do the same thing for research and for library resources, working directly with teachers. Um, both our librarians and our technology education specialists will have almost full caseloads next year of actually teaching classes. Um, so that's an example of how things will look a little bit different for some of our teachers. Um, and so again, it's not just about foreign language and ELA, but it is a lot about that. But I hope, I mean, you wanted to be clear that there are different layers to this. Um, we certainly feel like 
we want the message to be out there that this will impact middle schools in more ways than two, so one per grade level. Um, Ricky and I are completely dedicated with doing the most we can with the resources we have. So we are going to do our best, no matter the outcome, to provide the best education we possibly can for your children. Um, we believe in that wholeheartedly. But the bottom line will be that if we have fewer resources and personnel, it will be less than we're able to provide now, as well-intentioned as we are. Um, so, parting words? Um, I guess um, I'm preaching to the choir when I say this because we're all here. Um, but for those people who are at home as well, to what you can do is to try to stay informed. Don't be afraid to reach out and ask us questions. Um, you know, any information that we have, we're trying to push out information information to you um, as we know um, how things are going to look. So and we're trying to communicate very clearly with our staff what things are going to look like. So please don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions. Um, and we're going to advocate for our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We do have also a um, reduction of 2.0 FTE tutors um, in this budget as well. Uh, one of these tutors will be at the middle school, which will be quick and less massive math intervention um, during, in support during the school day. Tutors, by the way, I think there's sometimes confusion about tutors. Tutors are in school support during the school day. They are not um, after school extra help support. Uh, at the elementary, the tutor, it's actually going to be hours that are going to be reduced at each of the five elementary schools, which will be the equivalent of, of one FTE. Some of the non-personnel reductions include, um, I should say, the, the, another, a non-personnel reduction would be the elimination of virtual high school. Virtual high school is online computer, class, uh, computer program where students can take classes that we may not have available at the high school. So for example, if there is a AP class that we don't offer, um, a student is able to take it right now through virtual high school. Um, unfortunately, this will be uh, eliminated in next year's budget. And then as I mentioned already earlier, um, we are restructuring the high school um, assistant principal secretary, which uh, there are two secretaries right now, we'll go from two to one. Um, attendance and other duties will be restructured among the other secretaries at, at the high school. So we have a structuring of duties uh, to accommodate the change. There are some other impacts. As I mentioned earlier, we're uh, proposing to add a, a 1.0 FTE kindergarten teacher to address uh, enrollment increases that are going to be happening uh, that we already know for next year. With that is the kindergarten paraeducators, which we do have paraeducators at in all of our kindergarten classes. Um, this will maintain the 18 to 22 students per kindergarten class um, as well. And we also uh, are going to be restoring the district of technology and building budgets to the FY17 levels. Uh, as we mentioned on Monday evening, uh, right now we're currently on an eight-year cycle. We really need to get that down to a five-year cycle, uh, which is why we have to increase this back up to um, FY17 levels. I'm going to have in a minute, um, Julia Hendricks talked about the, the building based budget, so I won't go into detail on that right now. Uh, this is the budget by object. You can see that um, the reductions in professional salaries, that really is the reduction of staff, that of uh, teachers in the classroom that are um, in this cost center. The clerical salary is the, um, the restructuring of the high school secretary position, which is going to go to the administration cost center. The uh, other salaries are the increase uh, in the kindergarten paraeducators that we're adding to the to the budget. Um, contracted services is is the bus, the second bus, and an increase in homeless transportation. We are seeing a number of students who are um, identified as homeless that we are required to provide transportation for. Uh, that where their last uh, residence was in Reading, so we are required by law. If they are in a uh, temporary shelter outside of Reading, we are required to bus those students every day 
uh, to school. We do receive minimal reimbursement from the state for this. Um, so there is a, a lot of reimbursement that we get from the state for this. Um, and then the uh, supplies and materials increase. That is the building-based budget. We're bringing that back up to FY17 levels. I know it's a little bit difficult to see, but this is the uh, staffing. This is also in the, uh, the budget book. Uh, where the, the changes are is the elementary teachers is a decrease of three, which is the uh, elimination of four elementary teachers and the addition of a one kindergarten teacher. Um, another change is in the middle school, which we've already talked about. There's a reduction there of seven. Um, there is an increase of two power professionals, which is for kindergarten. Um, we, the school psychologist, which is difficult to see here, but the school psychologist goes from 10, which right now to 10.6, but in FY17, the budget in FY18 was 10.6. This was because we did not, we were not able to fill the position, so we took the funding and transferred it to special education so that we could use that for contracted services to, so that we could have uh, an outside group do the, uh, the IEP testing here at the high school. And secretary, there is a reduction of one FTE, and the tutors, there's a reduction there as well, uh, which reflects the, the reduction. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, I'm going to have Julia Hendricks come up from Birch Meadows. She's the principal of Birch Meadows. She's going to talk a little bit about the building-based budgets. But just um, to give a little bit of context, each school is allocated an amount of funds to operate the day-to-day -day operations. And that is based on the October 1 enrollment. So this year, we're basing, for the FY19 budget, we're, we're basing the October 1, 2017 enrollment. Um, and then it's multiplied by our per pupil amount. And then what we are doing this year is we're, we're bringing it back up to FY17 levels, or the initial, our initial FY18 proposal before we reduced it to fund the seven middle school teachers next year. Here's a list of all the things that are the building budgets um, supply and, and, and fund. Um, and now Julia's going to give some, some informa more information on this. Good evening, I'm Julia Hendricks. I'm the principal of Birch Meadows School. I'm in my second year. And this year I've been thinking a lot about our building budget and the fact that every time we make an expenditure <coughs> on that budget, there's a story behind it that is very directly connected to the education children are getting. And I have talked a lot um, with parents in my community, and sometimes people understand that we have photocopiers of the building-based budget and copy paper and art supplies, and your children are bringing home projects made with those supplies that we're buying. But there are also a lot of ways we spend that money that may not be so clear. So I want to kind of give you a couple of stories about how we've spent money at Birch Meadow and the way that it's really directly connected to what's happening in classrooms. So for instance, one of the things that all of our teachers are getting to is more small group instruction, more differentiated instruction, ways where they can, as children are assessed and then given instruction in the classroom in small groups that directly relates to their need. Well, last year we had to buy five tables because we didn't have enough tables in the school so that if you were running multiple groups in a classroom, there was places where you could put the groups. And that's $1,600 worth of tables. We had to buy easels because in some of those classrooms they needed an easel whiteboard that could be near an instructional space when you had a small group. So it comes under furniture, but it's also very directly connected that expense to the experience children are having in classrooms. Another way that we spent money um, out of last year's building-based budget is our teachers have spent a lot of time thinking about literacy instruction. And one of the things that I was getting feedback about was that teachers wanted more professional development around what's called the literacy continuum, which is we benchmark student reading levels based on this Fontes and Pinnell literacy continuum, but the teachers were saying, we don't feel like we totally understand that continuum. A new one came out in 2017. I, with the generous funding of the PETO, was able to send three teachers to the Leslie Summer Literacy Institute to learn that continuum. 
They're now providing professional development every month to the teachers in the school around the use of that curriculum and that continuum, excuse me, so that every teacher who is involved in literacy, including the librarian, our speech and language pathologist, are in those workshops. Well, every teacher needed a copy, every one of those people needed a copy of the new Fontesville Literacy Continuum. And supplying those out of the building budget was $2,550 for the staff. For a document that teachers are using every single day to connect assessment to instruction and deliver literacy instruction in the class, and that all of our literacy instructors are studying intently this year, so those are the kinds of things that get paid for out of building these budgets that are really connected to the educational experience that students in Reading are having. And it's not necessarily apparent when you see a list what the story is behind the expenses. So I just wanted to give you a couple of examples of the stories behind our own expenses out of building budget, which I know also echo stories that come out of all of the school's building-based budgets. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. So these are the, the numbers that go with the story that Julia was just talking about. So the initial fiscal 18 for pupil analysis is what we originally budgeted at the beginning of the budget process last year. You can see that that amount uh, was about 682,956. Uh, when we made the $100,000 cut, we had to cut from each of the buildings based on the per pupil amount. So we reduced the per pupil amount to, uh, to get to the $100,000 that you see there. So that, that was the funding level, that's the funding level that we're doing right now uh, for our buildings. What we are proposing is we go back to the funding levels now from, from the initial FY18. What you see here is we've also done some shifting because we, we felt we couldn't increase the per pupil as much as we wanted to because that would have been would have had to decrease somewhere else. So we've done a shifting of the per pupil value between FY18 and FY19 to reflect the, the changes in the needs at each level. So the elementary is funding much more uh, consumable now, particularly with the um, increase in the, in the NOAC science curriculum and, and other consumable areas in, in the in, in the curriculum. So that's why you see the shift that has happened um, where you see the, the increase. Uh, we also had a slight decrease in enrollment which also helped um, keep this level funded so that we were able to distribute the funding among the, among the schools easier. So that, that's the breakdown of what it would look like in FY19 and that's reflected in, um, in the regular day costs and in the building budgets. So on page 32 and 33 in the budget book is the uh, breakdown by detail. We've gone over most of it here. i just get on my glasses. So on 32 and 33 you can see uh, the different increases uh, that are listed here. Uh, just to highlight a couple of them. Um, the instructional specialist line item, which, which has gone up, so this year do not uh, forget that we uh, did not have the um, literacy coach, so what is reflected there is, is 0.2 of the data coach, which was in, uh, uh, in the operational budget this year, and we are uh, proposing, that's through restructuring, to take the literacy coach salary and fully fund the data coach in um, FY19, so that's why you see the, uh, the increase there. The um, increase in substitutes, which is on page 33, is to bring it back up to the historic levels that we referred to uh, earlier, and that was part of the cut that we made in expenses last year. Um, it was a one-time cut that we made in expenses last year for the seven middle school teachers. A lot of the other line items that you see in the detailed budget are from the building budgets. Um, so all of the eight building budgets are in are combined into these line items, which is why you see fluctuations from, from year to year in, in costs. 
And you can see uh, the last line item on page 34, uh, technology, we're, we're bringing the technology level back up um, from, from FY to FY17 levels. The last slide I want to show you, and I, I did refer to this um, on Monday night, uh, but I didn't show you the slide, uh, is where the reductions have occurred for classroom teachers over the last, if you include next year's budget, where they've occurred over the last um, three fiscal years. And you can see that if you, if you combine RISE with the elementary, we did have a 0.6 reduction last year in, in RISE for the music teacher. Uh, that Rise and elementary have had 6.6 .6 reduction, middle school would be seven, and high school would be seven. There are no proposed teacher reductions at the high school this year because over the last two years, the high school has taken the bulk of the, of the teacher reductions. Um, on Monday night, I showed you a slide that went back even further. Uh, I think it was to FY14 or 15, which shows that we do have other uh, FTE cuts in the classroom prior to FY17. But, um, and I can't remember the exact number, but I think it was around 24 or 25. So, but you can see that, that over the last three years, we've, because we've had full low level service budgets, the bulk of our reductions have been, have been now in the classroom. So at this point, we'll take, we'll take questions on regular day. John, uh, start it off. Uh, The, the on uh, his figure 22, did, I don't know what, did you hit on what, I, I hate the category other, especially when it's going up 22%, what, what is that? The largest increase in the other expense is the restoration of the technology, the $50,000 that we put back in FY19 that's not in FY18. So that's one of the, that's actually right above the other expense total, the technology line item. That's the largest driver. Well, the other, on page No, I'm on page 33. Oh, oh sorry. In the old row one. In the original budget. I think um, so did you see on page 35 there's the narrative um, talks about figure 22 uh, the building budget spending line that yep that's actually yeah. building base you're right Sherry okay. it's, a, it's a building base um, and those fluctuate mm -hmm. every year based on the needs of each building so the building principals submit their budgets in that it's based on the need that for that year yeah. I had noticed that as well uh, and then uh, what was the science did you hit on that if you the science at 88 percent that is where the funding for the no atom the continuation of no atom that are now part of the building based budgets okay. Goes so in there, so a large portion of the building-based budgets are now being allocated towards the no atom. Because we expanded a grade on that, is that right? We expanded a grade on that this year, or is no? So we have that grades three, four, and five. But yep. to do that type of hands-on science curriculum, there's a consumable expense. Right, but it went up a lot between 18 and 19. It went from 53 to 100. So that is based upon, if you think about when we do the science curriculum, oftentimes the first year of it was included within that first year purchase of it, and then going forward, the replenishment of the materials are now within the building-based building. budgets. Okay. And so will we expect that figure to, I'm sorry, Chuck, if you were still asking I, was, I wasn't done yet. Okay, on that question, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. And then uh, on social studies, what's that? Up 108, 16 percent. That's a so Oh, the 13 to the 28. That's also based upon the building-based budget. So that would be 
amongst all of the schools um, some of that was from the high school as well as they go through each year and look at areas that they need to replenish either books or materials so that is all principal directed as part of the building based budgets you know one if I could just add to that one one thing I know was confusing last year and maybe we should take a second is um, all of those line items where you see art, business, elementary curriculum, high school, oh, actually not that one, English language arts, equipment, foreign language, furnishing, that's all the building-based budget funding that I just referred to. So it's broken down even more specific by line item. So the amount of funding that was in that chart per building this year, um, this is distributed throughout all of these line items it's all combined for the eight schools. So that fluctuates each year based on the needs of each building. So that's why you may see different fluctuations in percent increases and decreases. All right, well, maybe we should say that in there because it looks like we're getting it. We're picking it up twice. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so, okay. I'm, I, happy to, I had quite a few questions actually. So, um, do we want to? So, rudely interrupted, Chuck. I'm sorry about that. The can we look at that hundred thousand as a somewhat stable number in the sense that I do understand there's going to be year to year fluctuation, but would we see in something like that vast an increase from year to year? Because that's a very large percentage increase. Sure. Um, the science, because it went from 53,000 last year up to 100,000 this year. So it, it should be stable based upon enrollment. It also depends upon the pricing each year. We don't always have control over that, but I would, I would, the only thing I would caution is if you layer in additional grades, then you would continue to see changes in that number. So if enrollment and rollout of it stayed as it is today then yes that would be a consistent number but if enrollment changes or additional items are rolled out then it would increase and again part of what gets difficult is the initial funding comes from the initial funding we receive from town meeting and then on an ongoing basis it gets built into the building based budgets are there okay how do you want to do this? Uh, do you want to Just keep jump going. into that? Yeah. Okay, I have a, a few more. Okay, um, I was also wondering about the um, instructional services that went from zero to twenty-five. Yes. That is what's in that number. Is every two years we do the risk-based oh, survey? Oh, the youth risk, the YRBS. The oh, okay. YRBS. What we also did this year to appropriately capture the information is we do also have foreign language translation services that we do. Historically, we have been utilizing the special education budget for that, mm -hmm. but it is not all related to special education, so we are now funding it, um, uh, items for that within the regular day budget. We did not feel, and that is outside of the per pupil that you see up here, we didn't feel it was appropriate. We've also had times when we've asked the buildings to fund that out of their building-based budget. We didn't feel that that was an appropriate thing to use their building based budgets so we have budgeted that in there as well okay. to capture that um, we can maybe talk about this one this one's a bigger question so I don't know that this is the right time to get into it but I'd love to know a little bit more about the um, professional development activities that are planned in that two hundred and nine thousand um, I had a question about kindergarten that's not, that's not what that um, in the kindergarten, how much is our enrollment going up, projected to go up this coming year in kindergarten? So right now we're at 300. Yep. My guess is we'll probably hit 320 at yep. least because there are several other students still out there. And I, the reason why I'm confident that number will go up is because there are siblings of those students that have not signed up yet. Okay. And, um, and so to to finish so right now we're uh, right, I think around 280 the year before we we're at 270 so we're gonna probably be up 40 students great okay and what percentage of our kindergartners are now going full day and uh, I believe, I know it fluctuates. 
I believe it's 78 percent. Okay, so I'm wondering then, there has the offset for kindergarten tuition, the revolving fund support on page 32 didn't go up, but it seems like if we're going to have 30 extra students, maybe about 20 more tuition paying ones, should that have gone So, um, I'll let Gail talk more about the revolving count yep. piece, but uh, we do have an increase in the number of students on free and reduced lunch, mm -hmm. which means that those students are either at no tuition or reduced tuition. Yep. We're seeing that across the board for all fees. Right. Our free and reduced is up to 10%, which is at the highest level in a long time. Um, so that means less revenue, mm -hmm. um, which means you can't use that to increase your offset. So, so even though we're going to have that much of a larger bump, we're not really expecting to We be don't necessarily reduced. know where those students are going to. We don't know how many will potentially be free and reduced. What we're also starting to go through now that we're month two and three into the year is to determine how much revenue we are projecting for this year so that we can look at it. We, since we did see a spike, a lot of our initial revenue projections are not coming in as high as we anticipated that they would so what we do not want to do is create a problem where we significantly increase the offsets only to have to decrease them what we do throughout the year is assess the cost in revenue and then if we have the ability to increase the offsets and can support that we would come back to the committee and say we have the ability to increase the offsets mm -hmm. which is a better situation mm -hmm. than projecting a very high offset and then having to decrease it and find the funding for that. Do we have a sense of when we'll know how many of those students are planning to be full-time? Uh, I'm full-time, I'm sorry, I'm going into my college language. Um, full day? We, we have full day numbers right now for next year they've paid their registration fee. The first payment's not due till May 1st. Yeah, you know, just because budgets are so tight, I, I guess I'm not wanting to be quite as conservative with that offset if we can possibly. On help. Thursday, we're going to be doing, next Thursday, we'll mm -hmm. be doing a presentation on revolving accounts. I think you'll see then that the number is actually pretty stable right now. And to if you increase your revolving account, that's the number you have to start with next year. Mm -hmm. And if you have a drop in enrollment, and that means you have to figure out a way to make up that difference in your budget somewhere else because you have to decrease the offset. That's the danger with keep your keep the fluctuations on the revolving the base in a way. Yeah. And yeah. what we're also still seeing is we are still seeing submissions for free and reduced, so we actually have started to issue refunds okay. for all of for oh. rise for mm -hmm. kindergarten <clears throat> for transportation. So we are still gathering a lot of that information. They come in throughout the year and we won't know for the new population until this time next year how many of that base are free and reduced. Okay, um, I had also noticed that the, um, with the help of some folks, that the census in um, the school population has gone down a bit and so, um, but now it's swinging up obviously next year. I know there are these kinds of fluctuations mm -hmm. And based on the census data, do we have any sense of um, how our school population might be growing or shrinking after this year at all? What do we have for we, we do not. Um, we've not done an enrollment study, which would cost money. Mm -hmm. um, you, to do a full enrollment study, you'd have to bring in a consultant like um, NESDAC or a group like that to do a full enrollment study. We've not done an enrollment study in at least eight yeah. years, nine years, I, not since I've been superintendent. So. We do not know what um, below five-year-olds, I mean, we do have census information, but the, the younger the students, the less accurate the census information. Because families move and yeah. so forth? And oh, families, yeah, families come in, families leave. Mm -hmm. Um, I did want to thank the principals, um, and I also wanted to thank the explanation about the building-based budgets and the teaching, um, the pedagogy. Uh, I think that sometimes when we, I, for me, I get so involved in the numbers, as you just heard, and I think it's so important for us to keep in mind that we're in a different era now. We need to teach for the emerging world. We have to embed um, teaching of collaboration, of creativity, 
um, of creative thinking, of problem solving, and we know that project-based learning and learning by doing is the kind of <coughs> knowledge that sticks with people and builds true knowledge, and that does take, as you're saying, uh, sm more resources, smaller groups, um, more training to teach that way, more resources. And I think that when we, we really have to think ahead, what are we preparing our kids for and what are we preparing them to do? And I really appreciate that you brought the importance of looking at not just what we're teaching or how many chairs there are, but why and what the outcomes are going to be. So thank you for that. And I can talk a lot about middle school, but I'll <laughs> give up. Thank you. Um, Go ahead. Okay. So I have a question about the stipends. If we look at there's two rows in figure 22. I don't know if these made it into the slides, but what I notice is that there's a department head stipend and there's a stipend stipend. And I just have two questions about those. I mean, I noticed that in the last, since 2015, they've gone up combined 50K. Um, not huge numbers in terms of the bottom line of the whole thing, but I'm curious, just to give a little bit of additional, so we got some additional detail and examples around the building-based budgets, if, if we could get a little bit of a better understanding about what the those guys are for, are they just for um, additional work that's done by employees to, let's say, coach a team, uh, do they have other, other uses, are they for professional development, and are they contractually obligated? Is the rate of increase there baked into contracts um, in different places? Thanks. Yep. I, can, I can briefly talk about it, and then I think I'll have Craig talk about the curriculum and stipends. Um, so the department had stipends, all of the stipends that we're going to be referring to here are all contractual. Uh, for the collective bargaining agreement. Department head segments are at the high school. Um, each department has a department head that has um, a reduced teaching load as, as well as a stipend. So they get time and a stipend to, to basically manage and run that department. Um, some departments have 15 to 18 teachers and other departments are, um, have a smaller amount of teachers. So they, there's certain roles and responsibilities that, that the department heads have and they are part of the high school uh, leadership team. The other stipends are, um, that would include, and correct me if I'm wrong, Gail, mentor stipends, curriculum leader stipends. Um, the new elementary team. The new elementary team, uh, uh, leadership team stipends. Um, those are, again, all contractual, and they all serve specific roles and purposes um, as part of the overall curriculum teaching and learning structure that we have. So the, the mentor stipends are, we are required to provide an induction program for new teachers, and the mentor is a key part of that, so they get a stipend for that. Um, I'll have Craig talk more about the leadership team and the curriculum leader piece. Yes, um, so the curriculum leaders are essentially the liaisons um, for their grade level or their department. Uh, content area, whether we're talking about elementary or middle level. And each, I mean, it's important to know too, those are individually not very large stipends. Um, so it's a, quite a number of people. I think they range from about 800 to 1100, depending on what the yeah. role is. Yeah. Um, the middle school also has traditionally <coughs> had interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary team leaders. Um, and then as Dr. Doherty mentioned, that would also include the um, leadership team uh, member stipends that we've just established this year at the elementary school so that we have sort of parallel leadership structures at each level. Um, but again, though, individually there are very small stipends, but there's a number of those. Thank you, and thank you to all the teachers and principals that have connected the numbers with the students. I think it's really vital for us to understand. One of the conversations that I know I've had with the superintendent um, is about substitute teachers and alternative approaches to using substitutes in classrooms. Um, I've seen it online as well, the questions come up again. And I was wondering if you could just um, talk a little bit about the challenges involved in not using substitutes when teachers are out. Um, 
because we have we're going back to our budget including more substitutes and there have been suggestions that maybe students could use um, technology to fill that time and um, I know that that is not um, feasible from our discussion so I wanted that discussion to be shared I have to remember what discussion that was. Um, <laughs> so substitute teachers, when, it, when a teacher is out for a variety of reasons, which could range from illness to uh, long-term subs to uh, for training purposes, personal days, um, someone has to um, cover and teach those classes, uh, which the lessons are, um, unless it's a significant emergency, the lessons are provided by the teacher that's, um, that's out. Uh, so the, the, the substitute teacher plays a key role. Unfortunately, we do not, we are not able to fill every single um, absence that we have, and that's because, and I've, I've said this before, and I've, I've been here long enough to see this, that when the economy is better, we tend to have less substitute teacher pool, um, and when the economy is not as good, the teacher pool, the substitute teacher pool actually increases, and right now, um, even through the efforts of our HR staff, um, we still, you know, we try we try as much as possible to re to recruit substitute teachers. Um, our teacher pool, right? Our substitute teacher pool right now is is lower than than normal. So what happens when a teacher is out and we can't get a substitute is we actually then have to use other staff like paraeducators um, or. Uh, whether it be special ed paraeducators or regular ed paraeducators, depending on the level, or tutors. Um, sometimes even administrators have to cover classes because we don't even have enough um, of that staff available. Um, they do, per contract, if they do cover those classes, they do get, not administrators, the paraeducators and uh, tutors, they do get an additional compensation for that uh, based on the contract for covering the classes. But that means when they're covering classes, other things are not getting done. Um, you can't just have technology act in the uh, role of a teacher because you do need an adult to supervise those students and you do need an employed adult. So we could not now start bringing in, for example, volunteers to substitute because there is a liability issue there uh, when, when we do that. Um, so I, I hope that addresses the question that brought up. That, that was, um, thank you very much. The other thing that we had discussed was the possibility of gathering in the older grades, gathering the students of those teachers that are absent into one place and why that wasn't feasible as well. So picture 150 students, high school age, in the same room, usually the performing arts center or the cafeteria with a couple of adults. I don't think there's going to be a lot of teaching and learning going on in that setting. Thank you. Thank you. I had heard it and understood it, and I just thought that that was important for other people to also understand. My second question, sorry, um, the, other, the other suggestion was about alternative sources for supplies, and I know that we use a collaborative to get the best prices for our supplies for the schools, and that is really helpful, um, combining forces so that the prices are lower. Um, the, the suggestion had been made to form community relationships so that some supplies could be donated that way or supplied that way, and um, I don't know if, that's not something I've asked you beforehand, so it might be something to ask later. We do get donations all the time, um, you know, in terms of goods, um, and the school committee has approved those as we go through. Uh, in terms of aggressively trying to do that, I mean, that would be great, and we do have people actually come to us and say, do you want this? That's, th there's pros and cons to that because if you accept it, it may not be exactly what you need, so then you gotta figure out what, what do we do with it. So technology is an example of that, because sometimes people will like to want to give us their technology, which is already older and would require support. 
Um, but in order to go out and actively solicit <coughs> from businesses, that takes staffing and hours that we, we just don't have the ability to do. We certainly always welcome donations um, if, if there's something that we can use in the classroom, and we have. And, we have. and, and I just want to say that um, so much of what we do have is donated by generos the generosity of our community and our, um, our families. And uh, case in point, I think about our robotics team and how it's gotten off the ground and within the last five years I think it's been and how much is donated to them because the kids have learned to how to go out to solicit and so I just want to say thank you because we would be in a far worse place right now if we didn't have those donations and that investment from our community and our families. Thanks. This is well. um, yeah. I have first a, a question on uh, the guidance line. The, there's an increase of uh, between 13 and 14.6 percent, depending upon which year you look from. So, could you just talk a little bit about what the um, guidance priorities are that that increase is supporting? I know Linda, um, you know, made a great presentation to us uh, maybe uh, four, three weeks ago. But so that that was that was actually a shifting. Um, uh, we we inaccurately shifted an FTE from a from a, a cut that was made last year. Okay. So the assumption was made that we had cut a guidance counselor last year when we because we had made a cut and the person was serving in a part time role and was not accounted for. So that's that's what that is. Okay. So there's been no change in staffing. no. There's no change in guidance staffing. Um, I, I just have another question on the substitute. So back on, on the slides that you presented, right? The, I know the 98,000 we took out of substitutes last year as part of um, the solution to the cogent plan forward um, was, is being restored, but I'm having a little trouble with the substitute line on um, page 32, because it looks like um, we're just increasing it 3,000. There are two different categories of substitutes. The substitute line on page 32, that is for long-term substitutes, for long-term coverage if there is an individual who is out on a maternity leave or there's a long-term. The substitute line that we... On page so that's considered professional sa okay. salaries because it's a long-term substitute coverage uh, for okay. a teacher that is out for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. On page 33, the substitute line that is under other salaries, that is the day-to-day -day substitutes. Okay. The reason there are two is we're required for Department of Elementary Education that we have to split whether it's professional covering a long-term position for a teacher versus a day-to-day. -day. So we have to budget it in two different line items. Okay, and as I was just going through trying to figure that out, I, I peeked over to the special education budget. Um, so there's not no substitutes in that budget? We have one substitute line item in, in that budget. That budget. Okay. All right. And that was that? Um, that was not cut as that part was, of. That was not cut. Only the Correct. regular day was cut last Correct. year when we were trying to find the $400,000. So one day second. Dr. Doherty, uh, I don't know whether it was last year or two years ago, we. It, for the first time in a while, increase the per pupil for the building base budget. Was that? Was that? Uh, <laughs> no, we haven't increased the building base budget. Yeah, well, per, we, it's it oh, stayed we, pretty we flat. Reappropriated the yes, funds. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so that meant an increase for the <coughs> for the elementary. Oh, I think at that time a decrease for the middle school and RMHS. Uh, and I see that with this budget we're bumping up the elementary again and we're holding the others flat. Is that, is that going to work or is, is, are you comfortable with that? Because I thought it, it we, uh, especially at RMHS, it had an impact on graduation expenses and stuff. No, the graduation expenses are built in. Yeah, so that that's fine. That's built in. I believe it's six thousand dollars or something like that. Um, we've we've done some. We've been doing analysis of of 
the amount that's available for each level and we're comfortable with it for next year. Okay. Nick? Yeah, I'm going to follow up on Chuck's question and then a separate question about kindergarten. So that 100000 that you have in that column on the slide there, that minus 100000 that was, I don't want to use the wrong word here, changed from the original budget. Right. It was how we balanced to add back the middle school teachers last year, so we physically cut it out of the building based budgets. They don't have that available this year. So those looking at that number, now we spring back to the original number, basically minus 40 bucks or so, right? Um, so there are those who will look at that, perhaps, and ask, what was the consequence to students of cutting out a sixth of that budget? What we were able to do, as we talked about last year towards the end of the year is because we did have salary sal savings available we reallocated that money because we knew we were cutting the funding this year so at the end of fy 17 we reallocated additional funds to each of the buildings as well as for technology pur purchases so you didn't actually take a hundred thousand we out you took a hundred thousand out of fy 18 sure. budgets sure. what we did is we allocated them additional funding in fy 17 because we had salary savings available so, so they were able to pre-purchase additional items at the end of last year based upon looking at their inventories that they would typically buy at the beginning of the current year so if someone says you found a hundred thousand dollars we had salary savings at the end of fy 17 that we utilized for this purpose so were the building based budgets underfunded by a hundred thousand dollars at the end of last fiscal year as it's shown up there i'm not no, sure it's this year it's this year we They're cut it out of the fy 18 budget what i'm saying is you made a hundred thousand dollar reduction cut. yes and they I appreciate do that yep there's what they call it regenerative funds or what people yep. leave the district Yep. You rehire people that for less money for whatever reason, and it, there's extra money within the cost center, and that can be directed <coughs> at the discretion of the superintendent. Um, but what I want to understand, just as a bottom line here, is if we're going to go back to this 682-914 number, right, what's the negative impact that you see for students of cutting that number, right? Because 100000 that, that's a big cut, and people are going to look at that and say, you know, we're, we're cutting teachers and I'm making all kinds of other you know, reductions in this budget, in this proposed budget, and, and I think what people may want to understand is, well, can't you just take another 100000 out of the building-based budgets and why not? We, we cannot because we will not have the materials and supplies to run our schools. And I think the building principals could tell you that, which I think Mrs. Hendricks did a great job of explaining how that funding is used. And the only reason you had those supplies last year was because of a fortuitous... Mm -hmm. That's not something, events you cannot predict before. Correct. No, correct. Okay. All right. So I was going to ask about kindergarten if that's, mm -hmm. that's okay. So there's three, there's an FTE, and I'm looking at figure 18 in the budget book. It's, it's just the chart of positions added, just the regular day portion of that. So we just talked about enrollment in kindergarten and shared in that question. Uh, so I understand enrollment's gone up. We have certain classroom sizes. We have certain space. Mm -hmm constraints and classroom size goals and class size goals. Does this assumption of adding in response to the increased enrollment in full day, right, for the 78% full day you said, does this assume that, in other words, are we adding the kindergarten teacher and these two paraeducators in this budget with the assumption that this is required for the half day students or is this because of the full day students and are we legally required to provide these FTEs for full day students? So the most difficult thing to predict is kindergarten enrollment because the census is never accurate um, and it's usually off by 20, 30 students. Um, that's what historically I've found since I've been here. Uh, so we do the best, and they don't move to the right place in the town. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what happens is, in, the school committee gave me the authority several years ago, was to be able to, um, if students didn't have siblings in the school, the ability to, within two miles, to avoid busing costs, to be able to uh, reassign students to a neighboring school, which we have done as best as possible balance class sizes it still doesn't always work the way we want it to because sometimes a student will move literally across the street from a school and you're not going to have them go to another school 1.8 miles away 
Um, that just doesn't that just doesn't make sense. So um, we we do everything we can to balance the class sizes, and the other factor is space. Um, so we also are seeing less and less kids in half day. Um, so we have to balance that and how we do that. So we're looking at different ways that keeping the budget in mind, but also doing what's best for kids. Uh, how would we assign those kids um, to appropriate spaces, appropriate classrooms, so that we have full day and half day programs that, that are appropriate for the students. So um, I know that's a long answer, but this is based on the numbers that I have right now and where those students are located in town. This is the staffing that we need for next year. Is, is it staffing that's required by the number of half-day students alone? We are required to provide half-day kindergarten in Massachusetts. However, we do have a very large percentage of families that have full-day kindergarten. Do, do you need these FTEs, this kindergarten teacher, and these two additional paraeducators to meet that legal requirement to provide half-day kindergarten to the students who have The school committee made the decision a long time ago to have full-day kindergarten. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. If the school committee wants to have a different discussion about that, then we'll have to talk about that. But what I have been directed to do is to provide, and we have a certain deadline that families have to sign up for full-day kindergarten. They're not guaranteed full-day kindergarten after a certain date, and that's in December. I think it's the 17th or something like that. At that point, they're on a waiting list. So that's that's how we, you know, that's how we do it. But just. So it's my, not in the best interest of students to start limiting that. So my understanding from what you're saying, correct me if I'm misunderstanding, is that we're adding an FTE of proposing to add an FTE of kindergarten teacher to FTE paraeducators in response to the demand for combined full day and half day students based on current enrollments. And location. And location. That's very important. And available space. All of those variables each year change. Understood. But this is not required, this full, the FTE for kindergarten teacher and the two FTE paraeducators are not required to provide the legal minimum, which is half-day kindergarten, to all those who enroll. Can I, can I, I, can I, can I, 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 don't, I don't think that's, I'll be honest, I don't think it's a very fair question because we have been providing for several years full-day kindergarten for students. So this is the staffing required to educate the students for either full day or half day. It's not legally required, I agree. Thank you. But there's a lot of things we do that aren't legally required but are in the best interest of students. Thank you. Can I, can I just, just like to add, I think the, we, have, we haven't as a committee uh, limited uh, other than with respect to space, right, that um, full day. We've tried to accommodate, continue to accommodate the growth and the interest in that program. So I think, you know, it would be, I, I almost hear part of this discussion would be, if we didn't want to add uh, additional staff, we would have had to potentially cap the amount of people that could be in the full day and say, we just, we can't do that because we're not willing to add staff and those students would then have to be in half day. I, I think there's still issues with, depending upon where those students are and, and the space, you yeah. would have to okay. you know, look at that. I don't want to get into the value judgments of the uh, budget components at this point. It just, if there's questions on, on the budget. Yes, you got one right now. Yeah. I think part of what I'm hearing in that question is whether, um, and maybe I don't know if it was intended this way, but we get a tuition from full day kindergarten families. So does the revolving account with those tuitions help to pay for some of those additional staff? We, we take an offset and next year it's $900,000 is what is being proposed and we we feel that that's the appropriate offset that we can take based on what our projections right now are for the revolving accounts. The danger of increasing that number, which I believe we said earlier, is that that's the number you start with the next year. So if you have a drop in enrollment, you now have to cut that amount somewhere else because you have to lower than the offset. It's kind of like using, to, to make it more of a macro level, it's using free cash. 
when you use free cash at the town level, and this happened a couple of years ago, we went from $2 million to $1 million, and we had to make significant cuts because we had to, that was part of what was causing some of the cuts is the less free cash is being used to the budget because that's the base that you start with going into the next year. No. Yeah, good. Yes. So, um, so did you say that the enrollment um, deadline was December 17th? That that For the full day. For the full day. Not, not so, half day, because... So that, of the past, December 17th, obviously, for next year. So, so everyone who's signed up to this point... Or they're on a waiting list. Or they're on a waiting list. Yeah. We have, they signed up with the expectation that we made a commitment that we will Correct. offer a full day kindergarten next year. So that's, okay, they do, they signed up with that expectation. I had, um, can, can I just say one more thing about kindergarten? Because I think it's very important is that what we do to educate students in grades K to two sets the tone for future years. So the more we can do for students in terms of instruction, curriculum, time, the better it builds the foundation level for those students moving forward. Could, could I ask a couple more questions about middle school? Is that okay? Sure. Thanks. Okay. So, um, yeah, and 94% of the children in Massachusetts right now are either opting for or put into full day kindergarten, I think, right? Depending on if their district um, either has it for everyone or offers it. Okay, um, as far as middle school goes then, is in the advisory period, I'm only familiar with Parker, but and tell me if I have this wrong, in the advisory period, is that where we're doing the Facing History and Ourselves curriculum at this point? Yes? That's correct. Okay, and that curriculum is in part, it's, it's around building citizenship skills, is that accurate to say that that's part of it? Will you talk about that? Because, um, you know, I really am concerned about if we have to cut back on advisory about that skill set for students. <laughs> We're looking for you, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Using a chair with a question. Sorry. Um, so the advisory, you know, we haven't quite mapped out for next year what it will look like exactly. Mm -hmm. we, we want to keep it in some way, shape, or form. Um, we think it's way too important to cut out, so we will maintain it. I think the biggest impact will be the ratio of teacher to student in that space, um, which is something we, with the reductions of staff, we just can't help that. And I think a huge piece of why our advisory programs are so successful is keeping that ratio low. It really keeps the connections going. That being said, we will have a, continue to have a strong curriculum, um, and we will still very much value and continue the pieces that of building empathy and building citizenship and identity in their community. Um, those will continue to be themes that we'll be working with kids. It will just look a little bit differently. Um, and could I also ask then about, um, in, this is my impression as um, an educator, as a parent. Um, so when I look at our kind of district scores, our test scores, I see quite a bit of fluctuation and variation that happens throughout the K through five. And I imagine there are a lot of factors for that. Um, but then when I look at what happens in middle school, it looks to me like there is, maybe part of it is kids development, the model. It seems like there's a real stabilization that happens in terms of, if test scores aren't everything, but it, using them as indicators. There seems to be a lot of stability. And then our high school scores seem very, very strong as well. So I'm feeling like what's happening now in the middle school is um, maybe because you can so intensively look in the team model of tracking each child's needs and strengths and areas for growth, um, that we seem to be able to make up for ground um, that happened in K through five and set a really strong path for high school. Um, I'm sure that some of that is the double literacy period in sixth grade, I'm an English teacher. Um, I feel like I'm concerned that the foreign language, um, if we are not able to continue that, that that might also impact ELA because as someone alluded to, 
when you're learning a foreign language, not only you're gaining awareness of the multicultural and global society, but you know, sentence structure, syntax, how sentences fit together, roots of vocabulary. And so I am concerned really about how that might impact across the curriculum ELA scores, but even the ability to decode language in um, science, where you're doing a lot of nonfiction reading and, and, and so forth. So am I, I, I hope I'm wrong <laughs> in a sense and that it, you know, that I'm overprivileging the value of these skills, but I'm afraid that I'm not. <laughs> and I don't know if you have an opinion about that. No, we absolutely agree. I and mean, there's definitely um, literature out there that supports the development of the brain and foreign language. And there's a direct connection also with science and math and success in science and math as it relates to foreign language. So it's, it's very interconnected with almost everything. So we absolutely relate to what you are saying. Um, and I don't know, so just to add to that, um, Sherry, uh, the it's it's one of the reasons why you know after five years of cutting everything else, now we're cutting this because this this is one of the last things that we wanted, obviously to impact was the whole middle school model, the, the foreign language, the literacy block, all, the whole structure. Because we realize, I think your data is what you were saying, the impact that this model, the teachers, the administrators, the schedule have on students. Thank you. Yes. So I want to talk about the no add -out curriculum. So, and consumables. So my recollection from the past few years is that we were, as a district, going to fund an upgrade, if you would, of the science curriculum in three stages. 350 k tranches of money that we asked for. We've invested, as a community, I believe, two of those three, the last one being last year. And we asked town meeting for that money, if I remember correctly, at one point. Part of the discussion around that, as I recall, was that these were standards that the state would be evaluating our students on, and it was important to align our curriculum and what our students are being taught with what they're being evaluated on, and, and just basically give them the best possible education, regardless of the test. Okay. What I want to understand is the cost of that curriculum for our district going forward. So I want to return to the discussion earlier about, it's from page 33 of the balanced budget book, but the science line, and we talked about this a few minutes ago, 100K, 100,323 versus 53,000, and I think it was Gail was talking about how part of that is consumables for this program. So what I want to understand is two things. First, my understanding is that this budget, this balanced budget, does not include that third 150K. <coughs> that's on your money. That's right? correct. Okay. Uh, and then, and then secondly and finally, what are the downstream effects, if you would, on our consumables going forward as a district as a result of adopting the first $300,000 of curriculum upgrade? So is all of this 50, roughly you know, 47K increase in science consumables, uh, if that's the right term for it, are the result of implementing the first two-thirds of no atom money? And are we going to be looking at an additional you know, 100K per year in consumables instead of 50 as a result of that. And if, if that's true, it would be helpful when we go back and ask for that third tranche of money to bake in the cost of the increased consumables. So help us understand the real cost of no atom going forward. So, you want me to begin? Yes, good. I mean, I, I think I'll begin by just by clarifying one thing and then I'll let Ms. Stout talk about how it breaks down. But the, uh, the no atom that you're referencing is just the elementary grades three, four, and five. Um, and part of that shift was we realized, um, in essence, especially with the shift in standards, we wanted to make sure that we were providing to students a real aligned program to that standards. And in essence, in the past, we, we hadn't been. Um, but the figure in here, if my understanding is correct, is not limited to elementary. Middle school and high school for years have been spending a lot of money on consumables because you can't really teach science 
um, without consumables. Um, so you're talking about test tubes and chemicals and, and things that, that you use for plants. experiments and clamps and whatever, whatever things that get used up. <laughs> what did you say? Plants. Plants. <laughs> Yeah, clamps tend to be used more than one year. <laughs> um, so that's what I was just checking with Ms. Dowd because I, I don't, off the top yeah, of my head, is, know how that breaks yeah. down. There is a component in yeah. that number that is middle school and high school, which is about $32,500 of that total is middle school, high school, science. And again, these are numbers that are allocations based upon the building principles estimates at the time we do this where they can determine that they do have the flexibility if they do not need science they can buy history they can buy math they can buy other items this is their best estimate as of today based upon looking at trends as well as for the no atom looking at number of students and the cost for the items based upon pricing we received Hi, good evening. I'm Heather Leonard. I'm from Tulane, Arizona, Kids School. Thank you for being here. Um, if I could just take a moment to speak to this yeah. to give a real life example. Um, so, and it actually correlates with a few other questions that were asked quite well. So, in my building based budget, um, the, the shift this year um, is after that initial purchase for the completing the grades three through five. That initial year, they bought both the durables and the consumables. Durables are the components that we use year after year. Mm -hmm. Some of those are the hands-on materials that the students are actually using and accessing. Some of them are the hardcover texts that they refer to over and over. Consumables includes both the examples of some of the materials and manipulatives that they use during the experiments, as well as student workbooks, which are actual really rich, rigorous texts that are non-fiction texts that the students use, access, and do what real scientists do. They write on, they work with it. So the consumables are things that you have to replace year after year. So after that first year purchase, then the consumable piece is shifted to the building-based budget. So given my student numbers, because that's what would create my determination how much I would need, I, this year, budgeted around $9,000 for my consumables for my grades three through five. <coughs> so if you take that average, and you average it across the five schools, that would take you about that $50,000. And if you look at the increase from my previous year to this year, the impact of that increase for the building-based budget, you could directly correlate that with covering my no atom, which previously would not have been covered. So that is something that, thankfully, that salary savings did go through because that was something that I would have had to take away $9,000 of just typical building management piece that I would have had otherwise. Um, and that would correlate with that. But that number is probably pretty close to what it would cost for each of the five elementary schools for the consumables, which is a new piece we're adding into our building-based budget. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure that I understand that. So, again, that was helpful in understanding what the money is used for. I still, I still see fifty-three thousand going to one hundred thousand from last year to this year, and I just want to make sure that we all understand: is it going to stay at a comparable level? Like, is, is no atom driving that, or is something else driving that? And it, what, what I notice is the change. I hear the fifty for K that yeah, I just heard. Is, that makes sense. This to me, is the first year. Change? This is the first year that it is in the building-based budget. So this okay. is the first year the principles based upon enrollment, based upon known pricing as of the physical date we did this budget, which is not necessarily the price that will be paid upon actual purchase. This is based upon pricing we received to come up with these numbers. So we would anticipate that that would be an ongoing charge that can fluctuate based upon enrollment and prices we receive from the vendor. So. Mm -hmm. While it is a reasonable estimate, we cannot say fact certain that that number will not change in the future based upon enrollment and prices we receive from the vendor. Is it fair to say there's a higher consumables burden as a result of upgrading the curriculum? Yeah, if I, if I could actually comment on that, because um, again, I seem like I'm a historian here, but we we used to hit, we, until No Adam came on board, we had a curriculum called STC. <laughs> which was over 25 years old at the elementary level. Um, we have been saying for years that we needed to upgrade our science curriculum. We were not, we did not have a strong science curriculum. The books that we were using at middle school were the books that 
I used when I first started teaching here in 1987. So that gives you some context of how we needed to upgrade our science curriculum. To go to a curriculum that is from t that's teacher directed to more student centered requires more consumables, ongoing costs, but it's better for kids. I think the other part that's important to note that these are building based budgets. So the building based budget total, well, albeit we did increase it to prior year funding, the principals need to make the determination where to put that. So they may decrease physical, I'm going to make. Julia will throw something at me if I say this wrong. We may decrease art, we may decrease physical education equipment, we may decrease paper to increase the science curriculum. So it's not a net, we did restore the building based budgets, but this, if the prices of this go up, they would then need to go through line item by line item and determine where can I take this from in order to add it there. So I think. It, it's a little bit tougher because a lot of them actually went line item by line item and said I can take 500 from here, I can take 1,000 from here, and collectively they shave all of their individual building based line items and reallocated their funding to this item. So, last point. Oh. Just, so, that's helpful. Um, for going forward and, and for this to, to be able to identify, we did a really good job identifying, I thought, in a previous school committee meeting identified exactly where literally Gail tracked every single dollar of that 150k which was tremendous um, I think it would be helpful eventually I hope we're in a position to ask for the last 150k not it's not in this budget but when we if and when that they come to be helpful to also account for the increased potential in consumables that may result from any upgrades in curriculum not just in science but because this is this is a big change year over year I just want that to be part of the conversation going forward about we're going to implement this curriculum, that's the cost of the durables, and there's going to be a higher consumables burden, and this is what it might look like going forward so that we're prepared to understand the consequences. I, can I just add one thing to that? that the, the funding that you're talking about, too, that, that, was, that went to the middle school upgrades. We did some couple grades at the high school. And so at the secondary level, for instance, as I mentioned earlier, they've already been accustomed to a consumable expense. What they needed, as Dr. Doherty was mentioning, was just updated, aligned curriculum materials. And so some of those were text, digital resources, all of those sorts of things, um, licenses, the technology to access some of that. Um, so I think that sort of durable, or I'm so sorry, consumable expense for the middle schools and the high school, there, we assumed that that was already baked into their, to their budgets. It just be supporting a different program. That's what? Thank you. Uh, so I, I do think that when we approved this and went forward with it, we knew that the consumables were going to increase. I think what we, we may not have been diligent enough in asking, you know, what was that number going to be? I think Mrs. Leonard just sort of, you know, laid that out. Now this is the first year that they've had to buy the consumables. Whether or not we could have, you know, known when we were doing this and, and asked for it to be spelled out to say, you know, what is that annual consumable is going to be? But I mean, we did know about it. I think it was clear that it, that this type of program, because we want the No Adam program for what it does, consumables were more. We just perhaps could have done a better job asking, yeah. you know, what is it that going to be? Well, Thank you. And to be honest, I mean, that's something that we talk about every year. You know, how this absolutely was an expense, but I mean. Ms. Leonard, correct me, but you know, I think if you said eight, nine thousand dollars. I don't think your per pupil was increased by eight or nine thousand dollars. Some choices were made in other areas of her, build, her building budget to make sure that she could do that within her budget. We were able to increase it slightly, um, but some other things had to be reduced in some other areas. So, I mean, there was some discretion um, in budgeting being done there. It wasn't just an increase. Yeah. Just one last thing. Um, you know, I looked at the, um, some of the sample questions for the, uh, what test did we take last year? Was it Parker? MCAS. MCAS. Yeah. MCAS. Next generation. I mean, there's so many similar, there's so many similarities between them. And um, when I was looking at the English section, there was this whole passage about something I have a passion for, which is butterflies. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was in the English curriculum and in the English test. Because when you look at the 
curriculum standards, I'm really struck at how they actually are building in kind of interdisciplinary approaches. So in some ways, although we have to kind of silo in the line items something that's science, when you're talking about the consumables where students are reading, note-taking, and writing in science, it's also feeding the ELA curriculum. So sometimes I think we can lose sight of, you know, it, it, they're not, students aren't necessarily having six mini experiences during the day. We're trying to give them one integrated experience as much as we can. So <coughs> I do kind of look at the science curriculum, having read the new science standards, the new ELA standards, mm. seeing the test samples, and then seeing what some of those workbooks are is kind of a piece of interdisciplinary approach to strengthen language-based learning across the curriculum. Program. But that's great. Yeah. That helps. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. And if you looked at the state framework for the literacy standards, on the cover it says it's also the literacy standards for science and social studies. And so it's expected that they, that interdisciplinary connection will be there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to, uh, as we did the other night, open up the uh, questions to the, to the audience. And we do have a microphone over there tonight. Yes. Downing, can, can you can go you, over there? I'm sorry. So it's recorded for RCTV as well. Good evening, Mary Ann Downing, um, Heather Drive. So you all were talking about No Adam, and I just like went to the No Adam website to get some pricing. And I'd like to know if the pricing that's on the website um, matches what we're getting. So it said, no Adam implementation example, complete implementation estimate, six to $11 per student per month. Complete maintenance sa sustainability estimate, three to $6 per student per month. So I don't know how many students we have in grades three to five. We would have to look, that's probably not enough information because it probably, my understanding would depend on the grade, the packet, what you're buying. That might be a very generic role. Sure, so, so what did we pay for no Adam? I don't have that readily. I don't have that right in front of me. The, what, the 150 for the science was utilized for many different items, not just no Adam. So I don't have a specific no Adam number right okay me. well that that kind of get it's probably somewhere between three and eleven dollars per student per month then if that's what they're quoting yeah, I guess we don't pay it that way we I, mean, don't I, I don't know no, I know that's that they're just telling any sort of curriculum when they're trying to program too I mean the more we you know you get better deals for larger amounts and how many grade levels you're implementing so I'd have to go back and look exactly what, what it oh. is but yeah okay so and and I you know Building on the science cost, this led to another question I had, and I've had this before, and I know I'm going to mix up technology and district-wide technology, but I saw that you had the increase in the budget on that from 50 to 100, and then I recall um, after the end of the summer, you know, including with the science implementation, we bought or upgraded like 400 computers already. Remember that? We, we had the discussion in one of your office hours. Yes, about we, we also put your information in one of the school committee packets. Yes. Right. So I'm just, right. So I'm just saying that was part of this, that 150K science, just to clarify to Mr. Bobbin. That, but I'm wondering, given that spending, why was the, why did we feel the need to up the technology um, money from 50 to 100? Did we have to buy more computers? The, uh, Fifty to, to the hundred thousand dollars each year is pure replacement okay. of aging computers and smart boards and other technology, instructional technology. We also have, I mean, I, and I, I don't know if you were here the other night, but um, I watched on TV. Okay, so the other night I gave a chart in the budget book that showed um, the age of our computers by building. It's in the I can't remember what page it is. Right now we're currently on an eight-year replacement cycle which is, you need to be on a five-year replacement cycle sure. or you're going to continue to have problems with technology. What that 100000 goes to each year is pure replacement of aging technology, smart boards and computers. Okay. It's not for new. Yeah, no, I just was wondering, since we had just done all that, why we needed to do 
new stuff right the, away. The computers that were purchased as part of the science curriculum are dedicated to those science classrooms because there's a lot of digital components now to the science curriculum at the middle and high school. I understand, but that wasn't, like all of the 400 computers weren't for science. I think it was 120 or something for science. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, there were other computers that were purchased by PTOs. Sure. Uh, a lot of donations by PTOs for computers. The REF as mm -hmm. well. And the, the, that line item also funds um, smart board replacement and all right. that That's why I said the well. district it's technology. Just right. Computers. All right, that was just a side question. Um, I had a, a middle school question, just something that was on the um, slide where it said they're going to have mathematics become part of the interdisciplinary team. And I didn't know if it was already part of it. Like, what does that mean? Does that change how there's different levels of math? How did, what's the impact of that? So currently, math is off team. Oh. So, right. so basically, what happens is foreign language teachers, since they would be not on team anymore, obviously, the math teachers would then be on team to make the four. Is, was the math on team in grade six? Math is on team. Maybe that's my so confusion. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think just one or two other things. Going, just briefly touching back on the sub substitute teacher question. So right now we're getting by with 100,000 fewer subs or are we having no. the problems where you have to Okay, I just want to clarify. So we are using part of the funding from the literacy coach. The position was not filled. So part of that, the original intent was that that would go towards professional development. We are utilizing portions of that to cover the substitute pool as well. So we are looking for other ways in the current year to be able to sustain the substitute pools. So you guys said you're still having problems getting subs, but you're still spending all the sub Where money you need? No, our fill rate is not 100%. And our fill rate, what I've noticed over the years is our fill rate goes down uh, in times when there's less people that need that type of employment. And we, over the current school year, we have made a concerted effort and we have onboarded several new substitutes in order to increase the fill rate and we are seeing an uptick on the fill rate. Okay, and the last question is just com um, completely different from this. So I notice you're cutting tutors, um, two tutors for 40K, you're proposing that. And the other, n forgive me if this was discussed the other night and I missed it, but I saw that um, in the extracurricular cost center, you're adding close to $20,000 for a second musical. And so I'm just wondering, <coughs> given the goals in our district of closing the achievement gap and improving math in ELA, would it not be better to um, shift that 20K to re restore one of the tutors and have one musical? What would also we would need to look at for some of that is the impact to the revolving account as well because if you cut the musical you would cut the number of participants that are in that show as well so we would need to do a, a it's not further a analysis cut. to see if we did that would it impact the number of students participating if it wasn't that type of show. So it's not, it is, I don't know anything about musical costs. It's not so absorbent that you can just say, let's just raise the ticket costs to cover that stipend, no, no, you can't sorry, do it? Not necessarily. We, we, budgeted four, we budget four shows. We're also trying to get more of a historical average, which is why you see a, a bigger increase, um, because it does fluctuate based on the type of show. Um, so we're assuming there's going to be two musicals and two winter shows. Um, which that's oh. what we're, okay. Well, I was that's just what we're I was just throwing that out there because it seemed like to me. But it wouldn't be a twenty thousand dollar reduction because you still have four shows. Well, you had you had to add twenty thousand, almost right, twenty for the stipend. Historical cost levels for the. But if we the change shows. the type of show, there would still be stipends. It's still involved, stipend. So it wouldn't be pay. a one hundred percent if you remove the musical. How much? It wouldn't necessarily be a one for one. And okay. winter shows have less students participating, so that's less revenue. Whereas musicals have more students participating, so that's more revenue from the user fees. 
Okay. I, I just was looking at the money and yeah. saying, hey, why can't we use that for a tutor? Um, very, oh, very simplified. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm David Corey, Mount, Mount Vernon Street. Um, I did some quick math in the back of the room and based on just this is the science curriculum and your question about pricing. If you're spending $9,000 for your building for the science curriculum for elementary school, that's a little bit more than $20 per student for the year. Um, I did a calculation as well. So if I took the median of between $3 and $6 and I did a four fifty per month per student in grade 3 through 5, it took me to $8,750. A month yeah, so we're, we're getting as good or better pricing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, second, um, Dr. Doherty, you said we're going to um, historical levels for the arts. I had a question about the musical as well. Um, as long as I can remember, there's only been one musical. Um, and, you know, I, I understand that musicals have more student participation, so then there's more revenue from ticket sales. So maybe they pay for themselves. I don't know. Um, but when you're, two, two musicals seems like it would be an addition of a musical, not going to historical levels. Mm -hmm. And so even if it you know, couldn't be used for offsetting tutors or whatever else, um, it, it, is it the right time to add uh, you know, a, a more expensive kind of show? We could st you know, we've, we've done four shows, great. One musical, great. Um, so is, is this the time, given the budget, considerations that we all have to add a second musical um, as a more expensive kind of show. I don't have an answer right now for you because it's not just as simple as cutting a musical because it's, it's more trying to get in line with the historical average that we had for stipends. Okay, so it's a combination and, of both. And I, I'm a big fan of musicals. Like, I just <laughs> want to say that. <laughs> and and we, have had, we've had, we have had years with two musicals. Last year. Last year, and that was uh, that was an exception. That was FY17, and the pr yeah. the proposed budget for FY19 is in line with where we were for yeah. FY. So my other question 17. is um, on page 33, just so everybody can turn their pages and get there. Um, the line item for curriculum high school um, down 53 oh, percent. Um, uh, you know, it, it fluctuates year to year, and maybe this is part of what you were talking about with the building-based budgets fluctuating year to year, um, but 53% reduction in curriculum for the high school strikes me as um, a lot. That may be impacted yeah, by the science. Is that virtual high school? Yeah. That's virtual high school. The year before it was up. Yeah. So yeah. the one time. A, so lot of, a lot of times it's replacement of textbooks and other curriculum materials and the need may not be there that year so okay. the money is shifted somewhere else within the high school. The other fact that it happened, don't forget, is that we did introduce new science curriculum grades 9 and 10 last year, which meant that those, that department did not have to use uh, that funding for science. Okay, thank you. Hi, Alicia Williams, 40 Marla Lane. I just had a question about slot page number five, the regular day cost center regarding the kindergarten. It says half day programs will be centralized to north and south campuses. Does that mean they're gonna get rid of the integrated model? Um, it's too early to tell right now. Okay. Um, we, as much as possible, want to not do an integrated model, but sometimes we don't have a choice based on space. So we are going, once we know, have a firmer grasp of our numbers, particularly half day numbers, because that's the driver when it comes to whether or not we do integrated, we will, we'll, and what available space is in the district, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Thank you. Thank you. I actually, it's not a question, it's just um, an observation. This. Um, the school system has tried very hard to support teachers in doing what they feel is best to meet the needs and the strengths of and and the needs and the strengths of their students. And regarding the musicals, when 
a teacher or a group of teachers feel that a certain type of drama is going to meet the needs of their students and the community because the role of the drama department is the students both on stage, behind stage, and the community because the, um, the choices of shows introduce community members, young ones and older ones, to different genres. And um, so the benefits are complicated and um, the funding might be more for the rights to the script and that kind of thing, but there's more involved in terms of supporting the teachers and what they think is right in the curriculum and that particular program needs to reach out to us. That's part of their curriculum. So I just wanted to make sure I said that. Yeah. Um, just a quick point is um, maybe is part of the musical count because there's usually a middle school musical as well as a high school musical. Does that get into it as well? I wondered because there have been no, middle think, school musicals. Yeah. It's a different. But my different children different. have done. Okay, thanks. So just last comment before we uh, move on to. Uh, special education just as we were talking about the science curriculum we didn't really talk about which i think is the most important part of it is where's the, the 150,000 isn't in the budget and you know i know we're going to talk about maybe putting it in the uh, uh what's the word reconstruction construction budget but you know i voted for that and I think some of you were here, uh, what, three years ago now, and it, uh, that vote was based on the fact that it was sacrosanct, and it wasn't, it was always going to be in the budget. So, you know, I'll be thinking about that as I do my deliberations with this budget and, and you know, what other trade-offs are in here, because, you know, I'm not sold at this point that, you know, we should be expecting to put that uh, $150,000 in a budget that we don't know whether it's going to uh, pass at this point. Thank you. And just to, just really sorry to further answer the high school curriculum. We did remove the virtual high school, so that was in that line item, so that's another oh. reason why you're seeing a decrease year over, over year. <clears throat> Dr. Dart, do yes. you want to Mrs. Like Wilson is now going to. Mrs. Wilson. Yes. I'm going to find a way out of here. Carol, come this way. <laughs> You're trapped. <laughs> I'm going to get a microphone. Oh, is that not? You might have to stand up there to be on RCTV. That's a better one, but you might want to use Good evening, so our night is now 9 o'clock. So I'm hoping I can keep you interested and at least be able to provide you with some information about special education. I'm Carol Wilson. I am the Director of Student Services. I am in my fourth year here at the Reading Public School. And um, my goal, um, and I am going to present this a little differently than the other cost centers because I think there's often a lot of questions about special education. And if you haven't studied this or don't have a child who has special needs, sometimes this can be very complicated in understanding what this process is. So my goals for presenting to you this evening are really to give you a very short overview of special education, probably not even what I would call special education 101, maybe special education abbreviated, um, so that you have an understanding of what, what do we do in special education. And then I want to share with you who our students are. Who are the students who are here in the Reading Public Schools? What does our data tell you? And then go through the cost center. Because I think you need to have those two lenses prior to really looking at the numbers. And I know this is a little different than how we've presented the other cost centers, but I think it's really important to tell the story of who our students are and to understand the work we do. I think the other piece I'd like to point out is that there'll be an opportunity for questions. If there are things that I can answer tonight, I absolutely will. If there are things that I need to do a little more digging to present out, I will be doing that next week. Um, so I encourage questions or emailing questions. 
Um, and I will, as I said, do my best this evening. As it is 9 o'clock, I'm going to do my best to answer those as thoroughly as possible. Um, the other thing is I think we did receive a question about one of the figures, and I am going to be reviewing that. And if we need to um, release a revised figure, we'll do that um, either um, tomorrow or next week, um, depending on just reviewing the accuracy of that. So let me tell you a little bit about special education. So um, the Student Services Office, which I am the Director of Student Services, special education is one component of the work that I do. I also oversee our 504 process. I oversee our homeless students, English language learners, preschool. Um, I know I'm missing something there. Um, so there's a lot of different nursing. Um, a lot of different things fall under student services. Um, the cost center for special education really focuses on um, our special education students and meeting the needs of those students with disabilities. And those needs are governed by the Individuals with Disabilities Act and the Section 504 um, Act. So what drives our work? What drives what we do every day? It's our students. First and foremost, the students with disabilities and the IEPs drive the work that our teachers do. What you're gonna see in this budget, that is what drives this work, first and foremost. Our collaboration with parents is huge, and I'm gonna talk about and review some of the information about um, our work with families, but collaboration with parents is a huge piece of what we do. We also, as I said before, the state and federal regulations are a huge um, component of us remaining in compliance. So we need to be up and familiar with both the federal regulations as well as the Massachusetts state regulations. And there's a new change, there's new guidance that comes out. And I also put up here recent legal decisions. So in March of 2017, the Supreme Court actually ruled on what is a free appropriate public education as it relates to student IEPs, and that's important information for both myself, our team chairs, and our staff to understand the implications of those type of legal decisions. We also are all constantly looking at our practices and how we can best teach kids. What are the evidence-based practices that allow us to meet the needs of diverse learners? Um, and then finally, it's also important to know that the IEP teams are what drive this process. So IEP teams are made up of the parents, the child if they're 14 and older, um, the special education teacher, the general education teacher in the classroom, and then any other staff members who are familiar with that child or have tested that child. Those IEP teams determine what goes into an IEP and what our obligations are as a school district in terms of consultation, in terms of service delivery. Um, and those teams are made, those teams meet and at least annually to review the student's IEP. And those happen day to day. So oftentimes when you're looking at numbers, I am giving you my best number. But today, there could have been 10 IEP meetings that took place in our district or out of district today that implement, that impact those services, those consultative services, those recommendations. And I can't always know that today. Um, but those things happen, those things change. So we do our best to give you that snapshot of information. So some examples of our students. Who are the students? So we've heard about our preschool and the needs that we have in preschool. We are seeing an increased need as our, at our preschool level. We are seeing three-year-olds who are coming to us who do not have any communication skills. They are students who are coming to us with feeding tubes. They may have vision impairments, hearing impairments, and we are welcoming those students in when they turn three to be educated here in the Reading Public Schools. Typically, we work with early intervention and we're made aware of those students around two and a half years old, so about six months prior to them turning three, but it doesn't give us a ton of time to really prepare for them. But we are seeing students with um, increasing more complex needs that we are, as you're seeing this year, we're building another substantially separate classroom to meet those student needs. At the elementary level, we are seeing more social emotional needs. We are seeing students as young as first and second grade who are requiring hospitalization. Um, and one of the great things in the work that you know I credit our, our TSP program at Kellum, they've made some shifts in their programming through the leadership of Sarah Novak, the principal, and Kelly Potato, the team chair, to create a program that really supports our students, that provides a model where students can be included in the general education setting when they are able to access that 
And when they can't, it provides them with a safe place to be to get their learning done. These are students who are presenting with social emotional needs. Killam has also welcomed students from other buildings this year um, who need to be in that supportive environment for an evaluation period. And so we're really um, proud of the accomplishments that Killam has made. At our elementary level in general, we are seeing a greater need for specialized reading, which is our Wilson reading programs, our, our LIPS program, our different <coughs> methodologies that we're using now. At the middle level, we have students with multiple disabilities. And through our program at Coolidge Middle School, the Compass program there, we're able to provide a substantially separate program that has adapted um, academics as well as community experiences. So opportunities for those students to work on their life skills, work on social skills, um, which has been fantastic. We also are providing a fantastic language-based program at Parker um, through the Bridge Program. We have been able to provide those students, um, our students with language-based learning disabilities, they have a profile being students who have average to above average cognitive abilities with a significant discrepancy in their reading, math, or writing skills. And so through the work that we've been doing with the Landmark School, we've created a model where those students have access to the tier one, the general ed curriculum, as often as possible because those classroom teachers have been instructed and coached on how to integrate language-based strategies into the general education setting. We're really excited about the work that's been happening there and the successes that we're seeing in those students. At the high school level, and we've talked about out-of-district placements, we're seeing an increase in out-of-district placements. We are seeing kids who are coming to us with more complicated needs. We're seeing increase in mental health needs. We're seeing school refusal issues. This is when students are refusing to come to school um, despite the parents' best effort. We're seeing substance use and a combination of discipline issues. Our counseling staff and our BCBA are going out to homes and working with families. They're arriving at their house at 7 a.m. And, and encouraging and working with the parents and working with children to try to get them to come to school. But this is becoming not a huge problem, but it is something that consumes a lot of resources of our staff because our desire is for students to be in school, so this is where the learning happens. And it does create a challenge for us. So those are some of our students. So what are some of our terms that are throwing around? An IEP is an individualized education program, and that's what you develop for students with disabilities when they're eligible for special education. We use a term called FAPE, which is the standard that we're provided, which is our obligation to students with disabilities is to develop an IEP that provides them a free, appropriate public education. So the key words there are free, at no cost to the parents, and appropriate public education. That Andrew F. case, which I referenced as the recent Supreme Court case, is the um, interpretation of what FAPE is. Um, in Massachusetts, that really hasn't changed much because we've always held high standards for our students with disabilities, um, but in other parts of the country, that's had a greater impact. So the LRE is the least restrictive environment. Our team, IEP teams, are challenged with considering that FAPE standard along with the least restrictive environment. How can we ensure that students have access to the general education setting? And as I said, on Monday at night, sometimes students are not able to access the general education setting. And we need to provide them with that fate, that free appropriate public education in a different setting, in a more restrictive setting. The IEP team, I talked about who makes that up, and that typically does not involve me. So I think that's just a really important piece for people to understand is that that IEP team doesn't always involve a building principal, doesn't it always involve me as the director of student services. I very rarely am part of those. Um, meetings because I am the one who knows the student the least. The people who know the child the most are the ones who participate in that meeting. A team chair in our district, the team chair is an administrator. Um, we have at the elementary level split the team chair position, so uh, no buildings have, except for Joshua Eaton, have a team chair just assigned to that building. They are split. Um, at the middle level, each middle school has their own team chair, and at the high school, we have two team chairs. Team chairs, uh, they run all initials and re-evaluations, as well as annual reviews for students who are in our programs. And they provide leadership at our buildings around special education, 
as much as they can. Um, I think it's more of a challenge at our elementary level because they are split between buildings and are not usually in one place all day. In order to be eligible for special education, there is a process, and that process involves that IEP team. A parent can refer a child for help to be evaluated, um, or a teacher may say, I, I see a student struggling, I, I suspect there's a disability, and they need to be evaluated. The key piece in eligibility is that first we need to determine, as an IEP team, that a student has an educational-based disability. And the federal government, through those IDEA regulations, sets up for us what those educational disabilities are. We don't write them in writing, those are what our teams are charged to use. So first we determine that a student has a disability, but that's not where the conversation ends as an IEP team. We say a student has a disability, then we need to ask the question, is the student making effective progress? And the team, the IEP team, has to discuss that. And if they say, no, nope, the student isn't making effective progress, then they ask, is the lack of progress a result of the disability? And if they say yes, then we say, do they require specially designed instruction or related service? The key here is the question the team has to answer is, do they require this? Remember, we all benefit from different things. The question in these cases is, does a student require teaching methodology that is different and that can only be given by a special educator, a speech and language pathologist, something different than what you can get in the general education setting in order to make progress? So all of those questions have to be answered in order for a student to be eligible and then we would develop an IEP. Our time frame for an initial eligibility I think is really important is that from the date we receive consent, we have a total of 45 school days to evaluate a child, hold a meeting, and send some sort of notice of action, which means either we found the student eligible and we're sending an IEP, or we said the student was not eligible and we're sending a notice around that. So there's a lot of compliance piece in this, and I think that's another thing I want to highlight is just sort of the monitoring of um, these timelines, ensuring we're in compliance with them, and ensuring we're meeting those expectations. So here are our students. Um, so you'll see that our total number of students on IEPs is going down. Our number of students in our district is going up, which we've talked about at several meetings, that, that increase. Um, but our number, our total number of students on IEPs is trending down. So who are these students? So we have 724 students on IEPs. Of those students, 532 of them are considered in full inclusion, which means they're full, they, they spend less than 21% of their time outside of the general education setting. And then you'll see from there, we have 101 students who are in a partial inclusion and 22 students who are in district and in a substantially separate setting. We also have students who are placed out of district, and so I wanted to share some data about that because there have been questions um, about sort of how that process, ha process happens. And so we have 69 students placed out of district. Of those 69 students, 16 of them are there for settlement agreements, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about legal services a little later on, but just know that 16 of them are there for settlement agreements. 53 of those students are there placed by their IEP teams by those teams who determined that those students need to be in a more restrictive placement, that their needs cannot be met in the right public schools, and so they determined they need to be somewhere else. So you'll see the majority of our students who are placed out of district are placed there by their IEP teams, and their parents are part of that process, and it's a very collaborative process. So, when a team determines um, a student requires an out of district placement, our obligation is that we need to look at approved placements um, first. And so we can look at public collaboratives, which are um, public day schools, or we can look at private special education schools, there are private day and private residential schools, depending on what the team feels the student requires. Um, and just to give you a sense of pricing, is that public collaboratives, their rates are set by their board. So we are a member of two collaboratives, the Seam Collaborative and North Shore Consortium. Dr. Doherty participate, these on both of their boards. 
And so he's an active member in sort of the rate setting process and the budgeting process. And so we're, we're typically well aware of any rate changes from those two collaboratives because we work very closely with them. If we send students to collaboratives that we're not members of, we don't get a member discount. And we also are not always aware when they're going to be raising rates um, for our placements. So that has happened to us where rates have gone up that we weren't anticipating that. For the private special education schools, what's interesting is they have the opportunity through the Department of Education to seek a rate increase every three years. And they basically need to make an argument that they need more money. And um, they do invite purchasers like ourselves to meetings um, as part of that process. Um, but we, we usually get notified about a year ahead that they're anticipating they will have a greater increase than let's say a 3% increase that the state might give them. So um, the state does set their rates, um, but we know that sometimes different programs have a greater rate increase. Yes. Carol, I'm getting messages that folks at home can't hear you. Oh. Um, okay, you I'll, I'll go over here. No, I'll kind of go over here. Thank you. Oh. All right, so that's kind of the pricing structure. And all of the rates for private special ed schools are on the Operational Services Division website and are publicly available, um, just so people know. Oops. So, where are our students placed? Um, I'm not going to get into details about how many students we have in each placement, but these are the places where our students are. So if we have students who um, require a therapeutic setting, we, these are the placements where our students are. I think it's important to note for those students in, in these particular placements, generally I would say that it is not a single diagnosis, but more that it's a dual diagnosis that students may have in these placements. Is this one not working? Can you, I mean, can RCVT TV can you tell hold us? it, Carolyn, probably. Just bring that wireless box. Is this not working at all? There is a wireless box. Oh, sorry. This, this is here. Yeah. This one's not working. All right, I will try to project more. Um, this, these are where some of our students are placed who have autism spectrum disorder. This is where some of our students are placed who are diagnosed with learning disabilities. Um, and these are the placements for our students who have multiple handicaps. And I did try to make a notation if it's a public day placement, so then you know which ones are private. Um, our in-district programs, these are our in-district programs. They really haven't changed from the last few years when I have presented them. Um, our connections program is really a, more of a full inclusion program, but students who are in there may fall under the partial inclusion category because they may need more services because it's individualized to each student. The Compass program is a substantially separate program and that's at Birch Meadow as well as Coolidge and our goal is to expand that to the high school as the students age up. Our Crossroads program is at Wood End, Coolidge and the high school and this is um, a program that's more of a partial inclusion program where students have the opportunity for instruction in a small group but also participate in um, inclusion time as well. The bridge program is for our students with language-based learning disabilities. That's located at Joshua Eaton, Parker, and the high school. We have learning centers at all of our schools, and learning centers are not more a program, but they're rather um, an opportunity for service delivery. So students may go to the learning center for reading support or academic support or executive functioning, and then go back to the general education setting. Our Therapeutic Support Program, or TSP, is at Killam, Coolidge, and the High School. This program really supports our students with mental health needs um, and provides a therapeutic environment um, for those students. And then finally, we have our POST program, which is um, our opportunity for students who are 18 to 22. It's a collaboration with the Wakefield Public Schools, and it offers students um, an opportunity to work on more post-secondary goals, those transition goals. They're out in the community. They are learning job skills. Um, we have students who, from POST who, are, um, who have been interning at the RISE Preschool. I have students who come in and do some work um, in my office. Um, they're a great group. Um, we love when they come. So 
Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the budget piece. So what is in this cost center? So I've told you about our kids. I've told you about some of the things that happen in this process. So what's in the cost center? All of the administrator salaries, the team chairs, myself, our BCBAs, our special ed teachers, our related service staff. So we have occupational therapists. We have speech and language pathologists. We have physical therapists. Um, we offer Per student IEPs, we are required to provide extended school year services if students would substantially regress. So that is in this budget, um, the services we provide in the summer. <coughs> Our legal student legal services, which I'll talk about separately. Home and hospital tutoring. If we have students who temporarily are going to be home due to a medical issue, we are required to provide tutoring. And so in this cost center, we have funds set aside to provide that tutoring. We have consultative services put set aside. So when we talk about students who have hearing impairments or vision impairment, our need is not so great that we require a uh, teacher of the deaf on our staff, but we consult and have someone come here um, for that service. Um, then we have evaluative services. So there are times that we need to have an outside organization conduct an evaluation of a student. Um, adaptive equipment and technology. Some of our students require very specialized seating or specialized equipment or certain types of technology and so we need to purchase those items for that student. So if they have a communication device, we purchase that. If they need a specific app for an iPad in order to communicate or in order to access learning, we purchase that item. We also have testing and assessment software for the evaluations we use. We we have a um, IEP software, eSped, that we use to as our monitoring system, as our software for tracking our IEPs. We use BoardMaker as a resource for our teachers. We have software licenses. We've moved to purchasing a big group purchase of Google Read and Write um, because many of our students are accessing that as well. We also purchase instructional materials and supplies that are related to special education. And then transportation. So all of those students we talked about who are placed out of district, we're required to provide them with transportation to that out of district location. So we work through the SEAM Collaborative to um, contract to get the best rate for transportation. Um, but that's included in here as well. We also are required to provide transportation for those students who need it in district based on their disability or if they are in one of our programs that's not their home school we provide transportation for that student so all of those costs are what are included in this cost center this is some of just the, the major changes. So you'll see any salary and benefit obligations to employees for the, the collective bargaining agreements or non-union staff. Those are included in what you're seeing here. We know we have increases in out-of-district tuition. Um, and we had talked about on Monday that we've made a conscious decision to not fund 130000 of what we're projecting um, and that we may need to go, depending on where things fall, we may need to, in November, go to town meeting for the additional funds either for uh, tuition or transportation. We, um, Circuit Breaker is something that I could probably spend two hours talking to you about. So I'm going to just be brief in that circuit breaker. We've talked about it as a grant. It's a very complicated grant program that allows us to get reimbursement for students who hit a certain threshold and cost. And so we're anticipating based on the guidance we've been given by the state that they're decreasing that reimbursement rate for this year. Hopefully it'll go up, but we don't know that. So to budget prudently, we're budgeting based on the guidance the state is giving us, which is that they're funding a 65% reimbursement rate, which would be a decrease for us of $200,000. We're also seeing decreases in our grants. So our IDEA grant, which is our largest federal grant, went down this year. So we're budgeting and anticipating that next year we'll see a decrease in that as well. In addition, we've had to set aside some funds for some new obligations um, called proportionate share. I have a link to my discussion about that in here because that, again, is something that could take a long time to talk about. Um, 
We also are seeing a decrease in our tuition revolving account, which we again talked about Monday evening. So we have some students who other districts tuition into our special education programs. This is fantastic. And we, we welcome this opportunity, but not at the expense of the students in the Reading Public Schools. And so although we, we we like this and it's working well. We are anticipating that some of those students are moving on or graduating and they won't be with us next year, so we need to um, decrease this offset. So some of the personnel additions that we've put in here, as we talked about um, a number of times, that we are having an increase in three-year-olds this year. Um, and so we need to add a substantially separate classroom. It is actually almost running started today so we are excited the students are coming to wood end but there are additional costs to this we need a preschool teacher we also need paraprofessionals and we are anticipating that at least one of the students is going to require the support of a one-to-one -one paraprofessional and so we need to build those we're, we're putting them into the budget right now and we need to build those in for FY19 because what we are hearing from early intervention is that we will have other students who are going to have needs come September and we didn't feel it would be in our best interest to eliminate this position only to add it back at some point next year. We also in this budget have added three special ed para educators. Those will be for our programs and needs. We won't be making those final determinations of their location until sometime probably in April because as I said, IEP meetings, if there's 10 to 12 happening, needs change, students who had support may have less support, and but we're anticipating through our conversation with building principals and team chairs and students transitioning to different levels and having different needs that we will need at least, we will need that three additional special ed paraeducators. Um, the restructuring that we're doing in this cost center is the BCBA. So last year I came to you all and I had spoke about our need for additional BCBA support. We built into the budget a very small amount by taking some money out of that consulting line and putting it in as a 0.5. We made a lot of efforts through the spring, summer, and even the fall to try to att attract a candidate and unfortunately a part-time position was not attractive to someone with this credential and so we have restructured additional funds out of our consulting line and out of our home tutoring or home service line in order to make this a full-time position we feel that it's critical to have two BCBAs in district because even if we don't have them in district we are paying for it through our consulting line and so that's where it's an essential component. In addition we put back in $15,000 for professional development or training for our special ed staff. Last year we made a decision to zero out that line depending on those grants that we had. Unfortunately as I mentioned our IDEA grant reduced and also our program improvement grant that we typically receive about $35,000 has gone down to I think $19,000 thousand um, dollars this year so we can't depend on those grants to provide the training the essential training that our staff need we need to have some discretionary funds to be able to be um, current in our practices and ensure that staff can get what they need to support our students so and I have our BCBA sitting right in front of me so if I say anything wrong she can step in so we currently um, in our district have one BCBA and this gives you a sense of what she currently does. Um, I oversee Lisa in her work because I want to ensure that her caseload remains manageable um, but I will tell you that there is increasing demand for this level of expertise in all of our buildings. If she could be in every building every day that is what they would ask for. Um, she is a her focus right now and where we've directed it is to support our in-district program to support our compass connections crossroads program as well as our post program 
This year, Lisa has also been doing some general ed support over at Joshua Eaton um, to really support some of our tier one work, which we don't always have the flexibility to do, but we're, we're, we're making that happen this year. Um, Lisa's also available to report out on home assessments. She provides direct consultation to parents, to teachers. Lisa does a lot of training for our paraprofessionals. So we get a lot um, out of Lisa. <laughs> Um, this is just the numbers of cases that Lisa is involved in this year. So you, as you can see, the caseload is high, but this doesn't mean that these are the only students in our district who require BCBA support. So I want to make sure people understand that what, I, what we are proposing is not to cut Lisa's work in half. It's actually to take the students who we are contracting out to other agencies and bring them to an, an in-district personnel. So I want to show those rates. When we contract out to SEAM, which we are a member of the SEAM Collaborative, we pay $110 an hour. So if we need to have a functional behavior assessment, which is the typical request as we enter into working with a BCBA, that costs us roughly $1,600 um, per evaluation. And so having someone in district would be a huge cost savings. The, the, the two people I had, the two agencies I have up there, SEAM and Creative Behavioral Solutions, are who we most directly work with because typically they are able to provide us with um, service providers. It is very difficult to provide to even contract. Um, we have found with SEAM Collaborative oftentimes they aren't even fully staffed to meet our needs and we're a member district. Um, sometimes we're placed on a waiting list um, and not able to get the services that we need. So the other advantage, and I look to the staff here, is having someone in district means you have the flexibility because that person isn't in Stoneham um, earlier in the day. They might just be over at another school and I can call them and they can come to my building and they have a little more flexibility. When you're contracting out, that person isn't familiar with your district, your system as a whole. They're not familiar with how you offer services, what you do in your district. Um, and so having someone who is part of our teams will really help build the capacity of our staff. I think that's what we've seen the most advantage of is that having someone here means we're all learning and improving our practice. Additionally, the other piece that we're looking for this BCBA to provide is home services. So as I said, IEP teams determine if students need services. So an IEP team might determine that a student requires home services or extended day um, services in order for that child to make progress towards their IEP goals. And so right now we have a couple different models we use to provide home services and to have BCB oversight of those home services. And the goal would be that would Come, um, become the responsibility of the person who we onboard. So the team chair line, I think there were some questions about what looked like increases in the team chair line. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. In that line in the MUNIS budget, if you're looking at the MUNIS budget, you will the two BCBAs that we are requesting in the FY19 budget are included in that. Um, there's also salary increases included in this line item. And just to provide some clarification, so last year we cut a 0.5 FTE, a team chair, um, which was our out of district coordinator. We have not restored that position. What happened when we carried over the budget from FY17 to FY18 is we captured a 0.7 position that was at the high school because we had a retired person helping us out who didn't want to work full time. But what we actually needed and should have had in the budget was a 1.0. So what you're seeing is the restoration of the high school position to a 1.0 because that is what we really require there. Um, and so that, that sort of creates some of the discrepancy. This year we've also had some vacancies which I've been reporting out. We had a vacancy at Birch Meadow up until last week. And so we've been filling in at Birch Meadow and Wood End with some different models that are costing us a little bit more. So the dollars and cents that are in the MUNIS budget are going to look a little different because the way we had to pay to 
fill in for these vacancies was a little bit tricky this year because we have someone who works two days at Wood End. We used an existing staff um, at Birch Meadow and, and so it was, a, it was very complicated. So hopefully we now have stability in that and um, we'll see a little more consistency. Um, the legal services line I think is another area that people have questions about so I really wanted to explain a little bit more about what that line item is. The Special Education Cost Center owns the legal services expenses for all student related issues whether they're special education or not. So I want to make sure people understand that. So we may be engaging our legal counsel for a discipline related issue that has nothing to do with special education. We may engage our legal counsel because we're investigating a bullying incident that has nothing to do with special education. Our legal counsel also reviews all of our handbooks. So we do that at, usually every other year we have our legal counsel review all of our handbooks. Our legal counsel is involved in reviewing all student related policies. So when we have a bullying prevention policy or other policies, those are reviewed by our legal counsel and that expense will show up in the special education cost center. Um, in addition, we also have our legal counsel provide at least annually training for our administrative team on recent legal developments, on investigations, so that we're staying current and are proactive in our practices. In addition, the, our legal counsel last year came and presented to the school um, committee. So all of those are expenses. Um, we do like our legal counsel but he does bill us for that time and so those are what show up in the cost center in the, the legal services line. Um, there were some questions about why such an increase last year. Um, a lot of those increases were related to our um, Office for Civil Rights um, investigation that was happening at Joshua Eden which I, I spoke about. Um, the findings from OCR at a meeting in September and so that investigation took a lot of um, time and resources from our legal counsel um, so I think that's important to know. The other thing I wanted to know under the legal services, can you just let me, thanks, um, is that when parents reject IEPs that's their due process right. So parents have the right to reject an IEP for any number of reasons. There could be a typo, there could be um, something that wasn't updated, there could be um, wording changes, there could be um, a whole host of reasons why an IEP rejected, but that's a parent's procedural right. They have procedural safeguards, and so that's their due process right to reject an IEP and to file for a hearing. So I wanted to just give some information, and I know there's some questions came up earlier, and I'm happy to get the information. But I provided some statewide data about the number of rejected IEPs, and I'm happy to find out for people the number of kids on IEPs in the state. But ultimately, there were 10,000 during um, FY16, there were 10,800 rejected IEPs. And of those, 568 parents requested a hearing, or there was a hearing requested, and this is statewide. And there were 23 hearing decisions. So I just wanted to show that statewide, the trends are not that people are actually going to a hearing, um, that things are resolved at some point in this process. And so then I wanted to show some of our data, which is during the 15-16 school year, we processed 103 rejections. Now that could be anything from a full rejection of everything in the IEP and the placement to a partial rejection of one goal or one service to a situation where a parent hadn't signed an IEP for 60 days and so we process that as a rejection because we make attempts to contact that parent and we're not hearing back from them. So those are all different things but if you see so for the 15-16 school year we had we processed 103 rejections in our office. Those were a total of 74 students. So that means that there were some families who chose to reject multiple times. Um, but again, if you look at our large number of 727 students um, on IEPs, the number of families who are rejecting were down to 74 families who are not feeling that the IEP is working. So then what I've put in here is those numbers of hearings that have been filed. 
Again, those numbers are high, and I will say the 9 and the 12 are high numbers for our district. Um, but you will see, again, if we look at the total, that, again, we're talking small numbers of families um, who are not having their issues resolved through that process at the team level. Um, I think there are some questions, you know, that's why I put in the information about our settlement agreement um, and auto district placements and really understanding that uh, the majority of our families are working with our building based teams resolving any disagreements and are not feeling they need to engage their own legal counsel um, in order to get their child's needs met. Did you have a question, Alicia? Yeah. What? So, did you want to wait? Hold on. Sure. Sorry. Hold on. Oh, sorry. Sorry. That's all right. Go ahead. Just wait. Will the Oh, the legal. Typically, all of the legal has been included within that. I actually am checking to see if we have the ability for all the DESI stuff to bifurcate the two numbers. And it would yeah. be a reallocation between the two cost centers. Yeah. But I just wanted for the public to really understand all the things that are encompassing that line item um, because I don't want there to be a perception that all of that is because of special education litigation. Um, so here is the cost center again by object and really looking at the changes. As I said, the salary changes are really based on contractual and non-contractual um, increases. And I don't think there's anything else. I've kind of highlighted the other pieces. Um, and then the breakdown of the special ed budget is on page 39 and 41. And I think I've highlighted the key things for you that are really increases um, that you'll see um, in that budget line. These are the links to some of the presentations that we've done previously. Um, because there's so much involved in special education, it's really important to review this information, to see what's been previously said. I will say the November 22nd is when our legal counsel came and presented on settlement agreements and public records requests, and I think that's an important one to watch. But these are different presentations over the last few years that I've done and wanted to provide a link so people could go and see those to get context because in these short presentations it's really hard to give a full context of what special education is, what are the different intricacies of what's involved in the work that happens day in and day out. So these are just some references for people. Okay, questions from the committee? Now I might come down because I need my phone. Yep. So Carolyn, on the uh, slide that had the Oh, page 18 of the handout, uh, the last, uh, the, the point about uh, the decrease in the, in the tuition involving. Yes. Yep. So, I don't know how, I can remember, and it wasn't that long ago, when we had one program in district, maybe, Dr. Doherty? Uh, yeah. That is true, about eight years ago. Yeah, so, we're... Now, with, with the programs, uh, and that's great, I'm glad we have all these programs, but do, do we have the capacity uh, within the programs to uh, still be able to uh, bring, bring students in from other districts? And if we do, uh, and one of the things that was, that was uh, talked about when we, when we developed the programs was it was ability to bring tuition into the district and I don't this is I think the first time I've ever seen this done where we've actually reduced uh, the tuition amount in a budget uh, and I guess is that uh, because we're not marketing it the way we should I don't I'm I'm trying to figure out you know how do we stop that from happening or is it, is it just because we don't have the capacity? I wouldn't say it's not because we don't have the capacity. I think we have to make sure that, I think as I said Monday night first, are we meeting the needs of our students? And I think what you're seeing is that we're having 
students enrolling who have increased needs and so we need to service those students first given some of the space constraints we have that's the other factor in all of this is making sure that we have the appropriate space to meet those needs um, and as you see in the enrollment numbers like some grades levels are higher than others and depending on the needs of those students some of our students I think of our compass program have a lot of specialized equipment and so if we had room in there it might be because you know someone moved out, out. Um, but we just have to be cautious of that I think we would if we our first question I always ask the team chair is do we have the space I ask the principal and the team chair or do we know of students in the pipeline because we need to make sure that our Reading students are being serviced first because I don't want to accept a student in and then say oh I'm sorry we need the space and we're gonna ask your child to leave so um, we are doing it we have students tuitioned in it is going well um, but you know and we don't really we don't mark it do, do we know how we can com compare to uh, other districts in terms of the amount of prog programs we offer or? I think we're pretty comparable in terms of the programs we, some, so some districts we actually offer a lot more specialized programs some districts have you know very minimal or they might just have a language-based program and then a learning center um, so we really do specialize and I think we've done a good job in that um, and other districts are doing that I mean I talk with other directors and and they're offering some great programs and we're always going to look at other mm -hmm. districts to see what we can learn and we have people come look at our programs too but um, I think all districts are looking to build programs in district thank you yes uh, thank you so um, okay so my question relates to um, the budget so on page 39 right this overall budget for special education for this cost center is an increase of 1.147058 million dollars which is represents 86 percent of the total increase for FY19 so again and that you can find on page 5 so staying within the FinCom guidance we are going from 41 million four hundred and one thousand six sixty one to forty two million seven twenty three thousand and twenty five which is three point two percent so of that three point two percent that one point three million special education is one point one four so I just want to make sure this is not just the accommodate there's other places in the budget where we we are showing accommodated and non accommodated so don't confuse that right okay so I'm trying not to be confused too. So the question is on with dealing with the decreases in the grants, the circuit breakers. So then you have to go to page 54 to see the revenue funds. Okay, and that's where I believe, Carol, correct me if I'm wrong here. I've been, I've been following this. Um, that's where we see the reduction in the grants. So. Uh, the award in uh, school year 18, I guess, although mm -hmm. I understand there's some timing differences, was $3.169156 million. And that's being reduced to 2.668. And you, those are some of the reductions that you highlighted. That's so, mm -hmm. so <coughs> our balanced or our FinCom guidance budget of the 42 million, the three increase, has this revenue number accounted for in it right so we we in terms of the expenses we're not um, I just want to understand are we or are we not um, you know really uh, under budget or have we already accounted for that so the, the challenge with the grants is that several of the the grants you can carry funding forward so the 3.2 million dollar number is current year fiscal 18 plus any carryover funds from prior years so it's not necessarily that was the actual award in the current year like the school climate grant we can carry funds forward title one and title two we can carry funds forward and these any known items for next year so for special education which is partly why we added back the 
professional development is we do anticipate that the IDEA grant will continue to decrease. We have the proportionate share, so we know there will be very limited funding within that grant to put towards professional development as well as the professional development grant itself has been cut. So that's why we did add some items back into the operating budget. So we added some of those items back into this one point. So that's why we added the $15,000 of PD back into the operating budget because we know the funding via the grants will not be there. I guess what I'm just trying to understand is that I think there's a, a perception that we're bypassing the FinCom guidance and not um, properly accounting for these decreases. But I, again, I look at it and I say, well, we, we are accounting for it because we're showing that the grants are reduced. The one that directly impacts the operating budget would be the circuit breaker reimbursement. Yeah. That's the only one that is directly within the operating budget in the accommodated cost because we have a certain amount budgeted for tuition and transportation and then as part of the budget process, that grant itself, we reflect that offset immediately within the budget. So. That's where the $200,000 decrease is reflected in there and is part of the accommodated cost through the FinCom process. That's the only pure grant that we, okay. the, the IDEA grant, we do have salaries and positions on there. We did take a close look at it and we did have to shift some of the positions because we know as the grant goes down, the do total dollar value available on the grant for those salaries goes down. We make it the same number of people, but the people on the grant can change based upon the funding. I'm not sure if that answers. The only other grant that we take an offset into the operating budget <coughs> is the METCO mm -hmm. grant, and we have kept that dollar amount consistent in the 18 and 19 grants. We do anticipate that grant may go down slightly, but we will look to other items within the grant itself. Thank you. If I could just add one piece to that. that anytime we use either a grant or a revolving account, it is captured in the detailed budget. Mm -hmm. So that's where you would find it. Mm -hmm. And let me uh, stay with the circuit breaker for a moment. So if I stay where we were before in figure 39, and I go to circuit breaker, so that should, that money is money that is typically reimbursed to us for out of district placements for special ed, is that? For students who need a certain threshold, they could be in district or out of district. So that's going down considerably, right? So that's 1.06. 1.062 million down to 860, roughly and 200. That is huge. a direct relationship to the fact that historically the funding has ranged from 70 to 75, I would say on average 72 percent. The state is reimbursing at 65 percent. So that is across all districts yeah. across the state. Can I, can, I just ask, can I just ask for a question? Is that in the governor's budget? Do we know that for? This actually is, this came directly from the Department of Education. This is actually the FY18 mm -hmm. reimbursement because we use the FY18 in FY19. So we know fact certain How much? what we're budgeting and that it will not go down. We do not know what the FY19 FY will be that we would budget for in FY20. So this is actually a definitive known number mm -hmm. that in theory will not go down unless something happens right. at the state level. There is always the potential that they could increase the percentage later in the year and you typically do not know that until June okay. if they increase the funding. And did you say extraordinary relief? There is an extraordinary relief process that we can apply for. That process opens February. 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 So we do intend to apply for that. Again, we will not know until later in the year if we qualify. qualify for it. So that's why we're saying we didn't fund 100% of transportation and tuition for those two factors that there are, there is potential of additional funding we don't know yet. And there is, it is such a fluid number with the number of students <coughs> that. It, so that number such as it is. That the is circuit breaker is what it is. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. only out of district placements, of which we have 69 no, right now. Could be in district, could be in district yeah, too. That's what I'm saying. There's a certain threshold. Okay. So I'm, I'm, it's a complicated formula. There's a spreadsheet we need to fill out, and there's a cost associated with each service as outlined in the student IEP. Mm -hmm. And so we go through each student, student by student, and we complete this spreadsheet. And if they hit that threshold, we receive reimbursement. So there are both in district and out of district students that we receive reimbursement. Does that always offset accommodated costs only? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. It goes 100% because it is, we utilize tuition against it, so we 100% always utilize it towards accommodated costs. Okay. So then flipping the page back to figure 27, transportation, pupil transportation, page 40, for special ed, that went up 245K. Correct. That can't help but notice a similarity in the numbers. Is that just a coincidence? That or is, is that a the pure coincidence. A, <laughs> they're not related. That mm -hmm. is when we did the updated projection for the current year. That's where we did the cost center transfers at a previous school committee meeting because we saw an increase in the number of students in out of district placements as well as an increase, correct me if I'm wrong, in the specialized transportation mm -hmm. needs of the students. That is based upon where we anticipate the current year to be so we actually it, it's not going to show on here because the budget was set a year ago that's actually where we anticipate this year to be and we have not increased so that it's in, anticipation for it's in line year. with this year and so yeah, I, I, what is driving that? Is that these 16 students that were placed in 2017-18 over the previous year the, the 53 out of district placements it's, it's last year it's a combination that, of the increase in the number the students the population of students could change, so while that is a hard and fast number that you compare A to B, the population of those students that make up that number could change. What also can change is specialized transportation of those students if they need monitors. What also is a variable cost actually every single month is you pay based upon the route and the number of students on the route. So if you are the only student on a bus going to a school you pay full price if there are three students on a bus going to a school you divide it by the number of students so it is based upon the route the school the needs of the students so it's it's actually every single student has its own story so, behind it. so to try to summarize this there's a i'll call it a double whammy yes there is yeah. there's a 200k drop in the circuit breaker accommodated cost mm -hmm. reimbursement plus the second whammy, 245,000 additional transportation costs as a result of an additional 16 out of district placements last year. Fair? And the varying needs of right. the students and some that needs are for being specialized placed. transportation. We definitely are seeing an increase in need for students who require uh, a separate and direct, which means they require their own vehicle to transport them to and from. They can't be with other students, so that means you're paying for that entire vehicle or needing a monitor. Or we have other instances where students need, um, they want to access extra color <coughs> here. Uh, maybe they're in and out of district, but they have a right to come here. And so you're adding in a different route so the student can come and participate in track or another activity that we may have. So we're seeing 445K additional need for resources in the community, not the movement of a circuit breaker 200k from one place to another, but we're actually seeing two independent things hit mm -hmm. the budget at the same time. All right, thank you. Yep. <coughs> so I'm not sure if I heard part of the answer to this before, but on page 13, of the handout, it talks about the number of students placed in the out of district placements being 69, and we have been talking about those um, about 16 without going into confidential um, information. Um, it says that they're placed per a settlement agreement, and that's a separate category than those placed by their IEP team. I'm assuming there's also legal costs attached to those 16 because it's a settlement agreement? Is that, um, can you just explain a little more? Sure, it, it may piece? or may not. So there may be a mediated agreement that didn't involve legal counsel. 
So I don't want to rule that out um, without getting into specifics. But um, if we have a settlement agreement or some sort of agreement with a family, we typically do engage legal counsel because it is a, a legal document that there are certain things you want to have in there. But yes, there would be a cost. But you have to remember um, when Michael Joyce, our attorney, presented, he also, I think, presented and talked about how some of these agreements might be multi-year. So those, I don't want the perception to be that those 16 agreements were made this year and those are those 16 additional. <coughs> so we can't make that assumption. Right. Um, and I want to be really clear about that, that some of our students are on, we have multi-year agreements. Those agreements may have been made three years ago. Um, so I just caution people to not jump to, the same there were 16, agreements made this school year. These students may have been out of district for a number of years, um, and I really can't get into those specifics, but I want people to understand there might be many facets to an agreement. Thank you. Yes. So, I want to talk about the, the Nate, what, what kind of gets, I think, lost in, in these tables and numbers. Um, and I just like to work, Carolyn, get a background input on, on our, Degree of student needs. Every student is unique, and certainly this area, um, you know, we have to meet students where they are. There's two lines I want to compare here, right? There are two tables. Figure 25, right? So that's our special ed enrollment. And you'll notice since FY15, about 85 fewer students are enrolled in the IEPs. But overall, for the last 13 years, we're always within 1% of the state average. So we're not aberrant, we're not particularly high or particularly low, we're about right. Like Goldilocks principle in terms of print, uh, percent. And I want to compare that to the previous, earlier in the previous table, figure 19, and the special ed, the, what I think, where it says special education, I believe that's the sum of all the FTEs that come below. It's that line on page 25. And so I couldn't help but notice that since FY15, We've had a drop of 85 students, roughly, in IEPs, but an increase of 15 plus FTD. And can you speak to, you know, and, and we're also talking in this budget for FY19 about adding additional FTEs to meet student needs on the enrollment at the beginning of the process when they first enroll in our school, phase three. Can you talk about, in your experience, how, you know, is this, is this increase in FTE driven largely by just the nature of the students that we have and the needs we need to meet? Is, is there anything structural that this committee can learn from your experience about building these programs with a firm foundation for the future? Uh, are there any instances where you think you know, we could invest more or we, we, there's a lesson we could have learned about how we staff these programs in figure 26, which is the individual breakdown? So I'm just looking for your insight and depth around that. I think as I mentioned Monday night, and I think Dr. Doherty mentioned as well, as over the years we have made cuts to regular day and we've continued to make cuts to regular day which is impacting the opportunities we have to provide interventions to support diverse learning needs we're seeing that increase come in our special ed that this is the place that we can provide that service and so we uh, continue to increase that and that really should not be our goal as a district our goal needs to be to strengthen that general ed curriculum and ensuring that we have the right supports for any learner who comes in and that special education is truly identified for those students with disabilities not those students who are struggling because we don't have those interventions or those tutors available that we are cutting and so I I think it's a combination of yes we are absolutely seeing very unique students come through our, our schools and we are servicing students who I don't think would be in public schools um, you know historically and that is a credit to our staff um, and their ability to take on those challenges and to be trained and to and us giving them those resources so you, you can't take that away but I think some of the other staffing increases as we look, last year we increased special ed teachers at Wood End and Joshua Eaton, right? So as we whittle away at our regular education program, we're also increasing those opportunities for us to refer or for parents to refer for special education and see that that's, and then I'm gonna come back to you 
and ask for more because those IEPs are driving those needs. So I think we have to remember we're always going to have students with significant needs, whether they go out of district or we're servicing them in district, and so we need to be prepared to meet their needs. But we also have to not forget the importance of our regular ed curriculum and that strong curriculum and those supports have a direct impact on our special education numbers and supports. Thank you. Is there any questions from the community? Yes, Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Barry Berman, Longview Road, member of the Selectmen. Um, that was a really interesting comment that you just made because I think when we start to look at the budgets, we kind of think of things in silos. We have regular day, we have special ed. Um, on my side of, of, of you know, the ledger, we have public safety and then we have other kinds of things. But what you're suggesting is, is that the impact on the budget cuts on sort of the regular day potentially is a driver for the increased number of folks who are IIPs because we just can't like get the kids you know, um, on track at an early time. So um, on the number side, and I know it's really high level and a lot of the stuff is, is you, know, you can't really disclose. So my question is if um, we wave the magic wand, right? And for the last five years, you, you know, Dr. Doherty, you had everything you needed to, to get it done. What percentage of kids who are now on IEPs would not be on IEPs? And I and, and can hard. I know, but is it it's is it hard. is it ten percent? Is it fifty percent? I mean, I know there's some kids who are going to be there anyways, right. but right. can you? Is there a way to kind of give that a little yeah, clarity? That's a tough one. Gary, I will tell you that where we've been focusing our time and energy and resources is in K to two. I think I said this earlier. That's where we've got to build the foundation because that's what sets the stage for future skill building for our kids. So if we're not giving the supports and the teacher training and all of those things there, it's gonna have a ripple effect down the road. Right. And that's, that's what we're trying to do right now. Okay. But from the other night, what it appears that is that you're, you're doing your best to keep K to two you know, kind of fully funded as it was, but if, if you know, the, the budget you presented the other night, not the superintendent's budget, but the other budget, um, it, it seems like on grade, you know, starting in grade three, those class sizes are gonna go up, and the, the, the benefits that you've gotten through K through two, you start to lose, and then they wind up coming on Carolyn's side of the house. So, you know, down, maybe it's five years down the road, and by that time, folks are frustrated, kids don't wanna learn, you know, so, I, I just, I really want to thank you for that perspective because I think a lot of us have just sort of like, okay, what are we spending on special ed and what are we spending on regular day? And you, you, can't, you can't divorce the two. So I, I think that that's an important concept for folks to, to, to understand going forward, that it's not going to be like, you know, folks who, um, who, who, are, who are having their kids on IEPs sort of, um, you know, competing with other kids. We're all, it, it's all of us, right? It, it's, it's just, it's, it's, you know, it's not one against the other and one, one cost center versus another. So I, I really, I mean, it got, I mean, it just hit a spark. So I want to thank you for pointing that out. And I think the other point is the success of our students with disabilities is solely dependent on the strength of our general education program. Mm -hmm. And we are so intertwined and that has to be our focus. That our students with disabilities are only going to achieve at the rate that our general education no. students are going to achieve. Uh, uh, thank you for pointing that out. Mm -hmm. Any other? Yes, Mrs. Down. Hi, Mary Ann Downing, Heather Drive. Can I just ask, I'm confused about something when we had the additional students out of district count of 16. Um, back on December 11th at the school committee meeting, you had, um, I'm looking right at the minutes here where you talk about we had an additional 20 students out of district. So why isn't that number 20? It's and not a, I think you can't say that it's 20. Like we have six, we went up 16, but there were 20 students we hadn't anticipated when we built the budget last year. So we were anticipating some students of that 53 who were either aging out, graduating, 
other things happening. So we were anticipating that number to go down. So the 20 that you said you needed the additional transportation money for in December is not the same as the 16 there? The, the, no, look, it is. It's, the, it, it's there included in that. You mean the 16 is included in the 20, or I'm just confused? The 20 is included in the the, the difference the is these are static numbers, numbers here based upon uh, data reported to DESE as of a point in time, so which is different than when we build the budget. So when I build the budget in November, I have, I'm going to make these numbers up. I may have 70 students sure. currently out of district. We look at it and say we think 15 of those are going to come back or graduate. So then Somebody's we say we're going 22, to have. They're graduating. So, the, so in the budget we built, we, we have, have 55 students. Who, right. I'm anticipating next year to be out of district. Fast forward it 12 months later when we're in what's actually happening. I may have 20 additional students from what I budgeted. Sure. The, and that number changes every single day throughout the but year. But that 20 that you talked about in December is built into that 69. Yes. That's just what yes. I wanted to be clear. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Doxer, Beaver Road. Um, I want to take kind of the Barry's point and actually Carolyn, your point. So we're seeing a lot of changes in the amount required to support the special education budget. At the same time, we're having to kind of really throttle back very strongly on the regular day. Mm -hmm. And what we just talked about is that isn't just impacting regular day, it's impacting everybody. Mm -hmm. So another double whammy um, that we're getting from that. Mm -hmm. Since everyone in the Commonwealth, and I guess more broadly, is starting to face some of the problems like cutbacks and circuit breaker, what kinds of out-of-the-box ideas can we come up with? You know, is it along what, what Chuck was talking about, figuring out how to market better? I, I don't like to use that word in this context, but maybe that's what it needs to be. What other out-of-the-box kinds of things can we think about? Because this just isn't sustainable, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, we're, we're in a tough spot. The regular ed program is getting creamed. Mm -hmm. Any, you know, it, this isn't something to answer tonight, I don't think. But what, what can we start thinking about out of the box to try to, to deal with this? Stay tuned Thursday night. And I mean that in all sincerity yes. about tomorrow. Oh. Right? Yeah. 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 What we are proposing for the reconstruction budget <laughs> is a change in structure to change where we do things. John. Thank you, John Arena, Francis Drive, member of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, is there any guidance in terms, you've got 200K of drop in circuit breaker, 200K in extra transportation, and uh, that's a third of the, of the 1.4 growth. So it's, not, it's out of your control, it's not even within your control. The big question is what's the next year look like? And I know nobody's got a crystal ball. If we did, we'd all be rich, we'd just pick tomorrow's stocks. But um, any clue what the trajectory of that line looks like? I, I assume it's not back up. The circuit breaker, yes. I would envision that that is not going to go back But is, back it, is up. it going to, is it likely to decline? Is it that the guy? Pretend the guidance we're getting is the last meeting I attended that Desi was at. They've basically said, be conservative in your estimates. They're it's not anticipating. As, it's gotten as low as 60%. Yeah. Yeah. We're, the fortunate thing we have is we do have a year in reserve many districts and many surrounding communities to us use current year and current year and they're dealing with the 200,000 shortfall after their budgets are already I done in there halfway through the year. I didn't understand what you meant they're using. Yeah. So the FY, the circuit breaker number we are showing up there is yes. actually the reimbursement we are receiving in FY18 that we will We're utilize in right FY19. I see. So there are districts that use FY18 in FY18 that found out earlier this year that that amount was decreased. Um, the, the guidance they've given is to be very conservative and do not anticipate that it will increase. So I can add to that. The, what I'm being told by my association, which is talking to the state house, is that 
The state is reluctant to increase the percentage any higher than 65% because they are concerned about Medicaid funding from the federal government. I guess for voters at home, that the point is that the states are trying to push more of the expenses to the consumers, to us, and that's part of that is the reluctance, part of that is the federal government. This is only probably going to get worse next year, and it's it's not an operational issue. It's uh, the way it's financed. It's unfortunate, but it, to Nick's point, it really is a triple whammy because you got another one coming right back on top of it. I don't have a better answer for it, but. I think conservatism this year is probably um, uh, the best approach because whatever we do this year, we've got to be mindful that you've got to survive in, an out, in, an, in a following year as well. Um, wow. And we continue to look at, at transportation. We've looked at neighboring communities to see who they have going to what schools to see if there's any opportunity to share busing and what the cost would be. Carolyn and I are actually working on that now to look at potential opportunities for even if it's one or two students can we get a different bus route with a different number of students so we're trying to uncover every rock yeah. that we can potentially look at i'm going to ask a question that i have asked before and I, I know the answer i think and i don't mean to embarrass but i think it's relevant in any large organization that hires hundreds of people um, take the employment divide by 40 and you have the average retirements per year People work 40 years, they work 35. It's not an exact science, but you're dealing with 10 to 15 to 20 people that retire a year. In general, their replacements will come in at a lower wage. So there's an ability to take a large organization and can include a factor of uh, salary recovery that comes from turnover. My understanding is the schools don't customarily factor that, and the reasoning being that it's not predictable. And you're absolutely right, it's not predictable. But it's probably never gonna be zero. It's probably going to be a number between a few persons and maybe a couple dozen. Would, would you entertain, for the, in the spirit of trying to get a more accurate operational number, um, factoring in a, a, a conservative, meaning small retirement savings component to try to uh, turn more of those savings dollars into the operational mission of the schools? We have looked at that and we have discussed it. We've started, as Nick knows, I've tracked almost person by person everything that has occurred this year. What we are actually starting to see is not necessarily, it's not the retirement, it's that the workforce itself <coughs> tends to not stay in one place as long as historically it used to. So whereas you might have people that stayed 20 years, we are seeing people that leave in a shorter amount of time than that, so they're not necessarily at the highest end of the salary scale. And we've had numerous instances this year in which for some of the more difficult areas to fill where we're actually paying more than the person I that see. exited. Mm -hmm. And in, I want to say in the sciences, we actually are hiring people that are at a higher step than the people that are exiting. So we're now actually starting to see the TEM, the tide stem a little bit where We've had numerous instances in which that pendulum has swung the opposite direction. Yeah, the so mid-career, the mid-career probably does, it, it's a break-even. Two people leaving at mid-career is the same as one person leaving at end-career, so it's kind of a wash, but you're, that's a good answer on some of the disciplines that are hard to hire for. You're hiring somebody at a higher wage, I get that. It might be an area to look at. If you just look at historicals, I, I'd trend, mm -hmm. I would bet on historicals as a better indicator for what the near term is. I agree with you, long term it doesn't tell you very much, but it might be an opportunity to uncover two, three hundred thousand dollars that uh, you'll find at the end of the year. I'd, it'd be interesting just to do the math at your historicals. Thank you. No other questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you very I much. Alicia does. Oh. Yeah. I know I had sent an email, Alicia Williams, 40 Marlin Lane. I know I had sent an email about figure 26 mm -hmm. on page 39. Yeah. I'm wondering, is there a domino effect to that being mislabeled? Speak oh, the mic. sorry, I'm not loud enough, I'm Italian. Um, other mic, oh, sorry. Figure 26, page 39. Yeah. Um, I know I had sent an email saying that it was labeled incorrect. Um, 
I'm just wondering, is there a domino effect scale? If it's, are we working off of two thousand? This is the current numbers. Right. No, I know that. Yep. So if it's late, are we working off two thousand FY sixteen seventeen or seventeen eighteen for the budget? That was my question. We take the count at October first for for this budget. We take the count October first. Yeah, it's a, it's a October first, two thousand seventeen. So we're working seventeen eighteen. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So the okay. Are yeah. we gonna? Are you gonna reprint the page yeah, or yeah. amend it? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for everyone. Oh, sorry. Page. Yes, sorry. Motion. Uh, page. Yes. Motion to adjourn till tomorrow night at seven. <laughs> All those in favor.